and gentlemen, and welcome to night six of the 2022 annual town meeting. We start off with a tedious necessity, and that is that I have to correct a number of votes from nights three, four, and five. I'm going to read the votes in the order of yes, no, and abstentions uh, so that uh, uh, without going into further detail. <clears throat> Night three, Article 8, main motion 28814. Article 22, motion to refer 23124. Articles 12 and 13, motion to refer 15395. Night four, Article 23, main motion 209338. Article 24, motion to refer 149948. Article 9, main motion 24133. Article 10, main motion 24522. Article 11, main motion 185420. Article 14, main motion 23213. <clears throat> Night 5, Article 28, substitute motion 83. 13918 fails. Article 28, main motion 103, 13210 fails. Article 29, the substitute motion. The final count is 111 in favor, 112 opposed, and 20 abstention. That motion failed, contrary to what we thought last Thursday. Article 16, main motion 22478. Article 17, main motion 23126. Article 18, main motion 22918. Article 25, motion to refer 621747. Article 25, main motion 231810. Just a word about time limits. Absent a uh, special permission from the moderator, uh, your time limit is three minutes. <clears throat> I was fairly casual about this uh, last week, but uh, I'm going to enforce it more strictly this evening. So we start with Article 29. And what, Mr. Rosenthal, you have a point of order already? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Marty Rosenthal, Precinct 9. I'm just wondering if that list that you uh, just read will be published somewhere. Sure, it's in the. It'll be in the town website. That's what I mean because most of us don't write shorthand. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> uh, you'll recall last uh, Thursday that we dealt with articles 28 and 29, single debate. At the end of the debate, there was a motion to for the question and that passed so that uh, debate was terminated. We then <clears throat> voted the motions under Article 28 and moved to Article 29. The first motion before you under Article 29 was the substitute motion. And as I said, while we we announced it, uh, that that motion had passed last Thursday. In fact, it did not. So that the second vote we took, which was the substitute motion as the main motion under the article is nugatory. That is, it doesn't count. So we are essentially completing our proceedings under article 29. This is not a reconsideration. A reconsideration would open up the entire panoply of uh, issues under the article. This is simply con concluding our business under Article 29. Insofar as the debate had been terminated, I've uh, asked two speakers to speak on the main motion, which is the only motion before you this evening. It's the uh, motion on pages 20, 29-3 to 4. That's moved by Mr. Ananian and seconded by Ms. Wu. We're going to hear from Ms. Chico. Uh, in favor of that main motion and for Mr. For Mr. Gordon with uh, 
other considerations, mainly uh, the result of the advisory committee on uh, that main motion. So I call on Ms. Chico. Thank you. Um, good evening. My name is Jessica Kiko. She, her pronouns, resident of Brookline. It's my pleasure to be here with you all to once again get an opportunity to talk about the benefits to our whole community of allowing lawful permanent residents to vote in our municipal elections and to strongly encourage you to vote favorable action on the main motion of Warren Article 29. As I've shared before in my day job, I'm an immigration attorney advocate for immigrant rights. I've worked with immigrants at every stage of their journey to the United States, and I currently oversee a program that assists more than 200 people each year apply for US citizenship. Um, Warren Article 29, if subsequently approved by the legislature, would extend the right to vote in Brookline's May town election to adult lawful permanent residents, more commonly known as green card holders. Uh, Brookline's green card holders have expressed their intention to reside permanently in the United States. They've chosen Brookline as their home. They're our friends, our neighbors, they're PTO volunteers, taxpayers, they work, um, they own property and pay, pay property taxes, they pay rent. In short, they have the same stake in the quality of life in Brookline as any of us. They have a stake in our parks, our schools, our streets, and our community, and therefore a stake in the accountability of our government to the people. Having local voting rights does not diminish the eagerness to become a full citizen because citizenship still confers many more rights um, to a green card holder. I can tell you from my work that the ability to vote in state and federal elections, especially in presidential elections, is quite often a reason cited by lawful permanent residents for seeking US citizenship. Um, and it's also important to realize that becoming a citizen can be a very long and expensive process. People must be green card holders for a number of years. And even after they apply, it can take many months and often a year or more. I have some clients that have been waiting more than two years, a wait that has become even longer um, due to the backlogs that built up during the pandemic. Application fees run in the several hundreds of dollars, and these are significant barriers for some. And nevertheless, while they work through the process, lawful permanent residents should have an equal voice in the local decisions, in the decisions about their homes and businesses, their property taxes, their libraries, the use of the green space in their town and their children's education. As I shared uh, with you last week, Brookline is far from alone in wanting to make municipal voting more equitable and inclusive. There are several other Massachusetts cities and towns um, Amherst, Cambridge, Newton, Wayland, and Somerville, um, they have all tried to extend voting rights in local elections. And just um, this spring, the town of Winchester passed a home rule petition to allow non-citizen voting. There's new momentum in the city of Boston as well, as we spoke about last week, especially following New York City's recent passage of non-citizen local voting rights. Voting yes on Warren Article 29 will set in motion the necessary legislative process for lawful permanent resident voting to happen in Brookline. And alongside the home rule petitions from a growing list of cities and towns across the state, it will also build pressure on our state legislature to address non-citizen voting more comprehensively by considering, for example, the statewide opt-in legislation of the sort that the resolution that we discussed last week had called for. So if you voted yes on the resolution last week, thinking it might strategically have a better chance of succeeding, please put that same enthusiasm behind the main motion tonight and vote yes to send both a strong message to the legislature and to establish Brookline as a town that walks the walk when it comes to equity and inclusion for lawful permanent residents. A yes vote tonight is a vote for a healthier and more inclusive democracy in our town. So I urge you to vote yes in the main motion on Warren Article 29. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Neil Gordon, Precinct One Town Media Member and a member of the Advisory Committee. Thursday evening, we voted yes on Article 29 a resolution asking for statewide legislation to allow any municipality in the state to let non-citizen permanent residents vote in local elections. In a few minutes, we'll vote again, this time asking for home rule legislation that would apply only to Brookline. I start with what those votes have in common. 
A resolution is a formal statement. If it includes a request, then it's a formal request. Similarly, a home rule petition is a formal request. In both cases, a request, and in neither case is any member of the legislature or the legislature as a whole obligated to act. The difference between last week's vote and tonight's, one would address a policy issue on a statewide basis. The other addresses the same policy, but would apply only to Brookline. The more powerful of the two is the resolution. And as I said in my remarks last week, a resolution was more likely to achieve the objective of non-citizen voting. I voted yes in favor of the resolution. Tonight I'll vote no on the home rule petition. Legislators and their staffs have long lists of what they want to accomplish for their constituent communities. What they don't have is a long time to achieve those objectives. Asking them to take time from their priorities to work on ours is a big ask. That's the ask of a home rule petition. 175 Massachusetts community, communities have filed no home rule petitions. 130 have filed one or two. Brookline has filed 10. Most cities and towns in Massachusetts seem to understand that home rule petitions are best used sparingly, save for unique local situations. Brookline elections are not, as policy, unique local situations. And by bringing this home rule petition now, we're compounding what is already a big ask. July 29th ends this year's legislative session. If we pass this home rule petition, by the time the, the town administrator drafts the necessary letter and the select board acts to get it to Beacon Hill, it's late June. To pass, it needs to be filed and then work its way through the legislature. Mm -hmm. Presuming it's passed, which is highly unlikely, the governor then has 10 days to act. If it gets that far, Governor Baker will likely veto it. If there is to be time for a second House and Senate vote, the home rule needs to be voted initially by about July 7th, one short month from today. Between now and July 7th, our home rule petition will need to go through the committee process, go through from first reading to second reading to third reading, an accelerated timeline just for Brookline. There's a longer timeline alternative as the official legislative session doesn't end for six months. That timeline needs 100% Republican support and that's not going to happen. So even if you think a home rule petition is the right path, and I still believe that it's not, annual time meeting is the wrong time. The right time is November. Petitioners were advised that the timing was wrong. They brought their Warren article anyway. Taking into consideration my two points, that a home rule petition is wrong and that the timing is wrong, consider this. We're squandering significant political capital by creating urgency where there isn't any. Even if, as is likely, our request hits a legislative dead end, we're asking for substantial effort by legislators and legislative staff, effort that does nothing for their communities or their constituents. Pass Article 29 in its current form, and we send a clear message to the legislature. Brookline doesn't respect you, doesn't respect your time, doesn't respect your priorities, your communities, or your constituents. I support non-citizen permanent residents voting in our local elections. I voted yes last Thursday, but tonight I'm voting no. We're asking for the wrong thing, so I ask you to vote no. We're asking at the wrong time. So I ask you to vote no. If you truly want non-citizen permanent residents to vote in Brookline local elections, don't squander precious political capital asking for what we're not going to get. I ask you to vote no on Article 29. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move directly to a vote. This is main motion, Article 29. A yes vote will authorize the filing of the home rule amendment. A no vote will not. Voting period has commenced.
That motion carries by a vote of 143 in favor, 84 opposed and nine abstentions. We now turn to article 34, under which the main motion is in the words of the article on page 34-1 and two, <clears throat> moved by Ms. Silbaugh, seconded by Mr. Gordon. Uh, please amend the article to convert it to a motion. And the way you do that is by inserting the words at the beginning of the motion, voted that the town adopt the following resolution, colon. Then the whereas clauses and over to the bottom of page 34-2 and delete the words or act on anything relative thereto. Ms. Silbaugh, you have five minutes. Thank you. I actually asked for six minutes, um, Mr. Moderator. You got them. Um, so can you put that into slideshow? Thank you. Um, Kate Silbaugh, Town Meeting Member Precinct 1. Warrant Article 34 is a non-binding resolution to make large group communications publicly readable during town meeting sessions. De minimis communications are exempt from the resolution, and this resolution explicitly relies on the honest judgment of town meeting members to interpret these terms. Next slide, please. We exercise government authority as town meeting members. Transparency during government proceedings reduces corruption, reduces bias, improves public reasoning for decisions, both because it improves our output and because it allows for accountability of town meeting representatives to the public. Transparency increases public trust in us and the bylaws we produce. It allows people to correct errors of fact and claims about a person um, with a point of privilege. It creates and preserves a public record of decision-making processes for those seeking to litigate against the town. For the past 50 years, progressives have fought successfully for reforms making government processes open to the public. Our transition online marked a culture shift in communication modes and requires mindfulness to unintended impacts on the core need for transparency in deliberations in a democracy. Next slide, please. It is a resolution. This means it isn't a bylaw. It's an aspirational statement. The warrant article avoids so many of your line drawing questions by deliberately turning those line drawing questions back to you. It's a soft touch in that sense. Next slide, please. Warrant Article 34 addresses large scale deliberations that happen during a public town meeting proceeding, not by prohibiting them, but by asking that we make those communications accessible to the public. You will be the judge of your own conduct. The town meeting handbook already asks you not to engage in large scale private chats during town meeting sessions. We would reinforce that through Warrant Article 34. Next slide, please. We moved town meeting online during the pandemic, losing the ways that physical spaces channel our conduct as we can physically observe one another. This warrant article will continue to matter if we want an option of hybrid town meeting. Next slide, please. Sunshine laws. There are laws that orbit around transparency in town meeting. Warrant article 34 is not making a claim about the applicability of these laws to town meeting. The claim is that these laws express values that do apply to what we do here, and that exemptions are meant to ease the legal burdens on volunteers. That doesn't make openness in government suddenly unimportant, and the resolution seeks to express that without burdening you with that force of a bylaw. The public's records law is like a state level FOIA, under town council's interpretation, chats during the meeting must be produced in response to public requests. That seems to underscore the public interest in them. One provision says that town meetings shall be public. There's no case law on this, maybe because the online environment is new. Another legal provision requires that if town meeting is split physically between rooms, the public needs to be able to hear from both rooms. This seems to reflect an idea that the public should be able to tell what's going on if they attend town meeting. The mass general law tells us the moderator regulates the proceedings, not each of us in our own coalitions. 
town meeting is exempt from the open meeting law. The state has also exempted us from conflicts of interest laws. This does not mean that the values of either openness or disclosure of conflicts are out the window. It means a law governing citizens to that effect seems too much for our volunteer status. Warrant Article 34 would address a loophole in the legal landscape because there is not any loophole in the values associated with open government. Next slide. So many scenarios that are all addressed by the provision of the Warrant Article on the screen. Mentoring and clarification seem fine and you decide. Precinct and caucus chat, is there something happening in there during town meeting that the public shouldn't see? A huddle over cookies or in the auditorium itself or in the hallway at in-person town meeting was completely visible to fellow town meeting members and to any public who came. Maybe that's why nowhere near the scale of what is happening with online town meeting happened in person. The search for the perfect equivalence confuses me. There are social and architectural constraints in an in-person gathering. They aren't perfect, but they are completely absent in the online environment. So large chats have flourished here and they undermine our responsibility to the residents of this town. Same response in defining de minimis. Any fair reading of the warrant article says that you town meeting members may be trusted to decide that. It's never going to be interpreted like it's statutory language in the hands of a Scalia textualist because it is a resolution with self-monitoring explicitly written into it. Next slide, please. Some have expressed other concerns, including First Amendment concerns. Wait until they learn about the open meeting law and FOIA and the laws requiring recorded votes and any other sunshine law of the past 50 years. Unlike those laws, this is a self-governing resolution. There are no legal consequences for failure to comply. This does not prohibit any speech. It asks us to make speech public, like a FOIA or public record law, but this is not law and only during town meeting sessions. Hamilton was raised. I love the musical. He feared the public too much. And no, it's not time to rethink half a century of sunshine laws so that we can keep our chats. Next slide, please. People have concerns. Warren Article 34 is designed as a middle road to balance these concerns. It does not prohibit side chats. It asks that they be transparent. It is not enforced by some outside entity. It trusts you to self-enforce. It does not address one-on-one -on -one chats. It explicitly exempts them. It does not draw the lines for you. It lets you draw them. It does not apply to clarifications. It explicitly exempts them. I wonder if we can achieve a hybrid town meeting if we don't figure out this problem for ourselves. It is the self-regulation we need to support hybrid proceedings. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. All town meetings should be public. Please vote yes on Warren Article 34. Thank you, Ms. Wu. Chi Chi Wu, Precinct 7, speaking in opposition to Warren Article 34. Warrant Article 34 would impose on town meeting a requirement for disclosure that goes way beyond what's required by current law. With respect to current law, we know the following. Number one, open meeting law doesn't apply to any town meetings, period, end of story. Number two, town council has opined that town meeting is subject to the public records law. Fine by me if someone wants to FOIA the WhatsApp chats. And the public records law is a major form of transparency. Note that the public records access doesn't just mean WhatsApp chats. It also means our own individual emails dealing with town meeting, even and especially those of the moderator or system moderator. All of it is subject to public records requests. Three, town council stated that it's unlikely deliberations via WhatsApp violate any of the requirements that town meeting be held in public. So nothing in the current law prohibits the WhatsApp chats. Warrant Article 34 would impose requirements beyond current law in that it requires disclosures in real time as opposed to after the fact. We'd be the only municipality subject to these heightened standards. Now, petitioners have said it's not binding, which is good because I do think there are serious First Amendment implications if it were. But even if it's unenforceable, I'm opposing Warrant Article 34 because it's written problematically. What is a large scale communication? 
Is it over half a town meeting members, i.e. about 130? What about 100 members? What about 50, which is less than 20% of town meeting? After all, that's a small minority, the equivalent of one out of the five select board members. Where do you draw the line? That's why the open meeting law uses a quorum of 50% as the line, because it's clear and definitive. One could easily argue a chat with only a fraction of town meeting members in it is not large scale. And remember, it doesn't apply to just WhatsApp chats. It covers emails, Facebook posts, posts, even chats by the cookie table because it doesn't say written communications. And it would One definitely minute. mean no more posts to the town meeting member listserv because all of us are on that. It applies to groups that include non-town meeting members, so it could apply to the PACS listserv. More importantly, the de minimis part, uh, first of all, it would mean I can't text a friend and ask her how you're voting on something because that communication is not de minimis because that word me means lacking in importance, which a text on voting recommendations is not. More importantly, the de minimis part wouldn't have any impact on the WhatsApp groups because the resolution only requires the communication to create a public record and town council is opined that those chats are public records. Look, if you're unhappy that the other side has a group chat, the solution is to have your own group chat, not shut down someone else's speech platform. The solution to speech you don't like is counter speech, not suppression of speech. And for, as for the idea that the WhatsApp groups are bad because members aren't paying 100% attention, let's be realistic. How many times during Zoom town meeting are you doing something else? Multitasking, please texting conclude, with friends, Ms. Wu, checking, I will, checking Facebook or Twitter or checking the Celtic score. Let's uphold free speech here in Brookline and not restrict forms of communication. Vote no on Article 34. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Neil Gordon, Precinct 1 Town Meeting Member, speaking for the Advisory Committee. Article 34, a resolution, seeks to limit electronic communications among large groups of town meeting members during the proceedings of town meeting. This article would only apply to exchanges that play, take place during town meeting and that are not visible to the public and would not apply to de minimis communications. The resolution is non-binding and without penalty. It would be enforced only by the judgment of each individual town meeting member. Under Massachusetts law, the rational basis of a warrant article includes the written explanation of the article and the public deliberations that occur during the town meeting session. The existence of large scale private deliberations undermines the reliability of that otherwise public record. The advisory committee recognizes the First Amendment implications of limiting private conversations, but as noted by this article's petitioners, free speech is not an unlimited right. The advisory committee found the petitioners arguments regarding both public deliberations and a complete public record thereof to be compelling by a vote of 17 to three with no abstentions, the advisory committee recommends favorable action on article 34. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Goldsmith. Hi, are you able to hear me, Mr. Yes, Moderator? Fine. Thank you, Jennifer Goldsmith, Precinct 11. Good evening, everyone. I have just three minutes and I'm going to speak quickly. I don't feel, I, I should say I'm not a lawyer. I don't bring the authority that Kate and Chi Chi do to this, but um, I have a question. Did everyone enjoy the listserv today who was on it, the, the camaraderie and warmth there? I, I only mentioned that because it, it feels like a very divisive moment among a group of people who seem remarkably in national issues to vote collectively in the same direction. But um, there is a lot of division within our group right now, and this warrant article really captures it. But I guess what strikes me, there are three points I want to make. One is, first of all, when you, um, you know, anyone who's been sick has often sought a second opinion because they're not sure that the first person is right. And I have that feeling about this article, that there was sort of a searching for some legalistic reason to make this so. And based on what Ms. Silva just presented, there really is no legalistic reason. This is a sort of grasping for something more official and that isn't there, that there, you know, and, you know, sometimes you just want to hear the most conservative course forward. This proposal is a very conservative course forward, but it doesn't prove itself out. Um, it, it doesn't make sense. And if we want to self-police, we can self-police, but this sort of bizarre 
I in for, you know, kind of quasi enforced self policing seems strange. What we are hearing, though, both on the list serve in here is that we can do better as a community with modalities of communication. And, you know, if WhatsApp isn't what you like, it's a matter of whack a mole. You know, it'll be a different technology next year and the year after. And if we make it about WhatsApp chats because you don't like them, or perhaps you, um, to quote uh, our former moderator, view subsets of town meeting as having become more, uh, let's see, self-styled progressives as opposed to the kind of progressives that we like, the defund the police crowd who are contemptuous of authority and tradition. Well, I guess what's one minute untraditional, but despite that, it, it is a way of communicating. Um, let's see. So what I want to say is we heard Mr. Gordon say that we shouldn't vote for what's right because it would be squandering our, our chance to get a better whack at the at when we were talking about um, having other, going one route, I'm sorry, I'm not speaking very clearly. I, 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 this, this issue is so emotional to me because Kate's bringing up the town meeting handbook, which as many people know, I put hours, days, weeks of work into over the past three years. The town meeting handbook is not law. It is not town meeting time. It is the opinions of one person. When we edited it, Mr. Gadsby and I, we edited out a lot of things that were his sense of humor, but didn't really translate well on the page. No offense, Mr. Assistant Moderator. But looking to it as fact is really just not a, a valid way to view this. Um, I, I guess I, to, to conclude, I think that this is a, a weirdly intentioned warrant that seems to be about trying to punish people using a tool that may be unfamiliar to other people. And underlying it really says, we need better ways of communicating, not limitations to communicating. There's nothing here that is about case law, about open meeting law, about anything Please other include, Ms. than, Ms. Ms. thank you. Then, thank you, Mr. Saltzman, you have four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Assistant Moderator, you hear me? Yep. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dan Saltzman, town meeting member from Precinct 6. I'm speaking in favor of this resolution. I'd like to explain why through a personal story. Before I get to that, I'd like to clarify a couple of things about this article. First, this is a resolution in the most classic sense. A resolution is an official expression of the opinion of town meeting. It's unenforceable. It's an expression of opinion. How we define things and where we draw lines is up to us individually. We're simply coming together as a group and saying that back channel hidden discussions regarding anything non-trivial are unacceptable. No one gets in trouble if this passes. No one will be censored. As an attorney who values civil liberties, I see no First Amendment problems. Common sense is our guide here. Common sense dictates how each of us interprets this resolution. So transparency is the key. Secrecy in the legislative process is what we're trying to curb. But what does that mean? What are we really trying to prevent here? That's where a personal story comes in. Several years back, I was involved in a debate at town meeting in person, old school with cookies in the cafeteria and everything. I was on a phone based group messaging thread with countless other members. It seemed fine at the time. It was a great way to strategize. It certainly had the potential to influence debates. Questions were being suggested, you know, someone go to the mic and say such and such, or someone needs to point out X, Y, and Z, that kind of thing. It was an incredibly effective method of organizing on the fly and in real time but it was not public, it was behind the scenes. It was contemporaneous orchestration of one side of the town meeting debate. The messaging thread was being guided by the article organizers, those generally more in the know on the issue, asking others to make points they felt they could not personally make, or maybe they already spoke, maybe they felt someone else needed to speak for political reasons, or maybe they just thought the point would be better coming from someone else. Make no mistake about it though, this was not de minimis communication. This was substantive coordination of one side of the debate. This was taking place among a large group of town meeting members. This was being done out of public sight during the debate. So I saw a message come through on my phone that night. Somebody needed to emphasize an important point. Someone needed to do it and do it right away. So I went to the mic. I knew what they were getting at. And I made the point to town meeting. A vote was taken, we won. To this day, I do not feel comfortable what happened that night. Those remarks, while certainly within my lexicon, would not have been made by me if I was not on that messaging thread. I represented an opinion to town meeting, certainly one that I hold and held at the time, 
but one that came out of someone else's thoughts at that moment, as if it were mine at that moment. When people start coming to the mic like this, it appears there's an organic groundswell of support happening right in front of their eyes. This has an impact, but this is not authentic. I have long since removed myself from this messaging group. But what I just described is to me what Article 34 is trying to prevent. Debate should be in the open. Debate must be authentic. That's it. No one can enforce this. You don't need to know exactly where to draw the lines. You will use your common sense to try and honor this expression of the opinion of town meeting. Let's keep town meeting debate as open and transparent as possible. Please vote yes on Article 34. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ananian. Oh, <clears throat> got an Ananian town meeting member, Precinct 10. Can you hear me? We can't hear you. Uh, I can't see me either. Um, Can you come back to me as the moderator? You're not coming through, Mr. Renanian. Okay, I'll come back to you, Mr. B Mr. Birnbaum. Yep. B I E R. Lee Birnbaum, town meeting member, precinct nine, and I want to encourage you to vote no on Warrant Article Thirty Four. Over these past weeks, we've heard a lot of arguments about why we need to restrict conversations between town meeting members, some by the petitioner and others with which the petitioner disagrees. Some of these arguments appear to be petitioner's argument that online communications are not sufficient for the public. The Warren article waves away the equally unpublic arguments about chats in the cafeteria or the back of the auditorium. And it's asserted that these de minimis conversations, but of course with no record, we have no way of knowing if that's ever been true. Unless we are really and truly talking about ending all such conversations, I see no reason that an online version of the cafeteria is in any way different. But moving on to others' claims, some say a separate channel is distracting, which appears to be a subjective claim at best and ableist at worst. Maybe it's that substantive debate should only occur on the floor of town meeting, which is a defensible and potentially logical argument, but clearly cannot be the standard because substantive debate happens on the listserv, at public hearings, on social media, and in the hallways of our apartment buildings. It's been said that the moderator is capable of ending side conversations at their discretion, and so vocal conversations capable of creating actual distraction is somehow preferable. This strikes me as an odd argument, and even still, it doesn't account for cookies, the bathrooms, texts, or anything else. Some are concerned that chat groups can be large, though it seems no one has any sense of what number of people is too many, nor has there been any enforcement of any size of group of people talking outside the auditorium. I've heard complaints that groups can be based on common ideology, to that, I ask why the handbook encourages us to sit in precincts when in, when in person, if not to have informal conversations that account for shared interests. It also seems naive to assert that town meetings had no factions prior to the last two to three years. Finally, there is this matter of the application of the public records law, but appreciate if town council could elaborate on this stated position from the listserv, itself, of course, not public. So while this debate is public, uh, the information that fuels it is not. The expansive definition shared in this opinion would seem to imply that any conversation in any context or format with any town meter, me, meeting member at any time constitutes a public record. Thus, I could request the minutes of PAX's Warren article recommendations if at least one person on the committee is a town meeting member. One minute. I'm a bureaucrat by trade, not a lawyer, but as someone who reads a lot of regulatory language, the law and guidance all appear to apply to executive agencies rather than to legislative or deliberative bodies. Indeed, the definition of government entity in the public records law specifically excludes the legislature. These bodies, except town meeting, are specifically covered by the open meeting law, which itself calls all open meetings public records and thus by reference subjects them to the public records law. But remember, town meeting is specifically excluded from the open meeting law, which means that the inclusion by reference surely cannot apply either. This, of course, also conforms to our everyday understanding of how town meeting works. We do not take notes when meeting with a friend or neighbor over coffee and talking about leaf blowers, lest they be subpoenaed. This leads to my conclusion that it appears that many of the concerns are far more concerned with who is speaking and what it is that they are saying, rather than how they are saying it. It seems exceedingly clear that there cannot be any logical reason to single out one type of communication for strong recommendations against, while not also addressing every single norm this body has had for centuries, and moreover seem anathema to the intent of town meeting in the first place. If proponents of this article want Please something conclude, to open meeting law, I look forward to the charter change issue they will bring us. But until then, I recommend a vote of no action on this Warren article. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hahn.
excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Assistant Moderator, Gina Hahn, Town Meeting Member Precinct 3, uh, urging favorable action on Warrant Article 34. At Brookline High, they have a saying, we create the culture we want. It's an appeal to students to consider how their individual behavior shapes an overall culture that either promotes or inhibits goals like honest collaboration. Warrant Article 34, a non-binding resolution, is just this sort of appeal. This resolution asks town meeting members to acknowledge and reaffirm their adherence to the long-standing norms of town meeting, whose purpose is, to quote the town meeting handbook, to promote unprejudiced discussion, to ensure that deliberations and debates relating to matters being considered at town meeting are public and accessible to all town meeting members and Brookline residents, and to manage respectful decorum at town meetings. When we conduct large scale side conversations during town meeting using encrypted messaging apps, apps that allow for message deletions and that may or may not become part of the public record, we as representatives are moving farther away from our goal of transparency and public accessibility. We're also contributing to the politics of division. In any meeting or debate, it's customary to abide by ground rules to enable the meeting to proceed smoothly, fairly and effectively. Warrant Article 34 is merely asking each of us as town meeting members to uphold the norms and standards that define town meeting as a single open public debate by exercising good judgment and discretion when consulting a colleague for clarification on a matter under consideration. I think it's fair to say that each of us has, as select member John Van Skoyek put it in an earlier debate, a gut level understanding of when we're seeking honest clarification from a fellow town meeting member or mentor and when we're engaging in non-public deliberations or strategizing as part of an advocacy group. Members of the WhatsApp group from last fall's town meeting conceded the necessity of transparency and the need for public record. They offered to demonstrate how that platform could work by creating a second, but this time public facing group to which they've invited all of town meeting. But as anyone who's, thank you, but as anyone who's worked in an office recently knows, it's possible to carry on multiple chat threads simultaneously, some public, some private. No one's ever said that that first group has stopped its private chat, just that they've made public a WhatsApp group chat available as an alternative. So without town meeting as a whole collectively resolving to foster a culture of restraint around outside conversations, where all large scale side chats during town meeting proceedings are avoided, this practice will inevitably continue, further eroding public trust and worsening polarization. Warren Article 34 seeks to translate the culture of respect and restraint from in-person town meeting, a culture that has served us well for more than a century in Brookline to our virtual town meeting. I hope that we as town meeting members have the courage, self-discipline and integrity to conduct our proceedings as a single body in public for the record and according to established rules, because that's the only way that we can earn the trust that the public has granted us. I ask you to join me in making this pledge by voting favorable action on Warrant Article 34. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Flint. Flint. Anthony Flint. Thank you, Mr. Assistant Moderator Anthony Flint, Precinct 5. Uh, I rise tonight in opposition to Warren Article 34. Uh, this resolution is anti-democracy. It's anti-free speech. I was actually astonished by some of the conversation on the listserv today, where in one case, uh, someone was fretting about whether uh, the discussion that occurs on an online chat was accurate or not. You don't get to decide whether what I think is accurate, quote unquote, or not. Uh, you have no business trying to control my speech. So let's move on from this paranoia and navel gazing and get on with the real business of town meeting. Vote no against this silly resolution. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ms. Hummel. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Amy Hummel, town meeting member, precinct 12, and a co-petitioner on this article. So this warrant article is about good governance more than anything else. It's, it's about meaningful and best practice transparency during town meeting. And it speaks to our ability to effectively self-govern by asking each one of us to commit, um, Jean used the word pledge and I like that, to participating um, in one 
cohesive and openly public deliberation during town meeting. You know, when a group of town meeting members got together and began using a sash, uh, social media app, unbeknownst to many, if not most of us, it's likely that they did so because of the benefits of connecting during the pandemic. That was appealing, especially, you know, you know, coalescing over common issues. There's a sense of normalcy of using these apps in other parts of life, so it made it seem harmless. Um, but, you know, and, but like any technology, there lie, there, there's a double-edged sword and we need to consider the downsides and that's what this Warren article asks us to do. Um, and the way that I think that um, use of this app, it doesn't have to be a certain WhatsApp chat or even that, that social media forum itself, it could be anything, but it, it, the practice undermines town meeting um, you know, in a couple of ways. One, just to, in and of itself with no orderly or open process create, you know, this, this group ended up creating an entirely separate conversation outside of our normal public process. So there was so much energy put into that. Ms. Goldsmith spoke about that earlier, working on the handbook, you know, what's in there, what's not, you know, it, it just, but we really put energy and effort into this um, collectively. This was something entirely outside of that conversation. Um, it also creates just another layer of content, right, and communication. And, and the last speaker, you know, noted about what's accurate or not. I think it was more to the point of, you know, not not ask, not agreeing or disagreeing with how someone frames a question, which is fair, but but about if there if there are true factual, um, you know, factual errors, um, they need to be corrected, and they can't be done if they're not done in public. Um, One minute. Thank you. So, you know, um, during town meeting, our deliberation should be done in public, not as a sidebar. Um, certainly, you know, and make no mistake, chatting in the hall, talking to a, a, a neighbor, see that, you know, that in no way resembles the idea. If you took, you know, 50 or 100 people, whoever is on the sweatshop, and they all suddenly surged to a corner of, of the town of the high school or the auditorium, we'd notice the moderator might stop moderating and ask what was going on, or, you know, there might at some point fail to be a quorum, and we would notice. So if this is happening online, it should be no different. And so I think that's a good way to sort of visualize what it's trying to do. I want to speak briefly also again to the First Amendment. No one's First Amendment rights are remotely at risk. I think you're actually, we're encouraging you to ask your questions openly. Sign up to speak. If, if you didn't sign up and something comes up, get into the chat line or when we get back together, stand at the mic. If it's late Please in the conclude. process, speak by all means speak. Um, but let's do it together. So I will conclude, oh, there's more to say because I think I'm running out of time. You have run out of time. Thank you, oh, sorry. So let's agree to engage in one accessible, focused deliberation for all of our sakes. We regularly ask others to regulate themselves. Let's, let's, let's be good citizens. Conclude, Ms. Hummel. Please vote favorable action, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Vogt. Hi, uh, Marissa Vogt, town meeting member from Precinct 6. Um, I agree with the pro-transparency arguments that the petitioners have made in favor of Warrant Article 34, and I would like to see more of the principles of the open meeting law apply to town meeting as a body. But what I don't think we should do is set rules, even in a resolution, that apply separately to our behavior inside and outside of town meeting, because the OML makes no such distinction. And we shouldn't pass this knee-jerk reaction to new communication methods that have developed during remote town meetings without first making a serious effort to understand the needs of folks who say that these WhatsApp or other group chats help them participate in and understand the proceedings. I've never been to an in-person town meeting, and since roughly a third of town meeting members are new this year, I'm guess guessing that many, if not most of the folks listening now, are in a similar position. We've all also never had a hybrid town meeting. There are so many unanswered questions about how hybrid town meetings will work and how we can use technology to enable town meeting member communications during these meetings in an efficient and transparent way. So why are we in such a rush to pass Warrant Article 34? But even more importantly, the reason we shouldn't pass Warrant Article 34 is that its effects will be felt unevenly. It will limit conversations from newly elected town meeting members who would benefit from more than de minimis conversations with their colleagues during town meeting. It will limit the participation from town meeting members who are joining remotely during hybrid meetings because of childcare or health or work or, or other responsibilities. 
Remember, the Warren Article 34 petitioners have not made any visible effort to demonstrate or even test the feasibility of using other platforms for a public group town meeting member chat. WhatsApp is not ideal for many reasons that I don't have time to get into. And finally, and most importantly, we need to think about the public. For folks watching at home, at, watching, um, at home, for folks at home watching on VIG, many town meeting member communications, big and small, have always been effectively, if not literally, out of view from the general public, both One during minute. and outside of town meeting. The idea that cookie chats have always been public is just dismissive of the public's actual experience. If we were seriously concerned with the public's access to uh, town meeting deliberations, why would this Warren article only apply during town meeting and not to group deliberations outside of it? So please join me in voting no on Warren Article 34, but encouraging uh, future, future efforts to, um, to bring the principles of the open meeting law to town meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Neufeind. And Mr. Lowenstein, I'm not gonna take a motion for the question yet. We'll have a couple more speakers and then some questions and comments from the floor. Noya find. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Assistant Moderator. My name is Bettina Noya find. I'm a town meeting member from Precinct One, and I am a co petitioner on this article. And I would like to speak to the intention behind this article. I think, as um, a lot of people have, I think, um, spoken to what they think the intention behind it is. And so I, I just really felt like I wanted to share what mine is. Uh, I value the opinions of all of my colleagues in town meeting and of all of the residents and, and participants in town meeting, whether elected or not. I reserve judgment on my votes until I've heard as many voices as possible. My intention in co-sponsoring Warrant Article 34 is to turn up the volume so that I can hear all the voices. My intention is not to silence anyone. Uh, there have been a lot of references to the idea that this is going to stop conversations and, and curtail communication. And, and my intention is exactly the opposite of that. We bemoan the demise of civility in our polity, locally, nationally, and internationally. I don't know about you, but at my house, we all behave better when there's company. Good manners kick in when we're observed. This aspirational self-policing resolution appeals to our better selves to set a higher bar in much the same way, but not for its own sake. Public open deliberation produces better laws and better government. Google deliberative democracy and you will find reams of research detailing how sharing out information and then engaging in substantive discussion results in better, more informed votes and allows people to change their minds based on more complete information. Sharing deliberations publicly works in service of these goals. As Kate Silbaugh explained, small scale exchanges are beyond the reach of Warrant Article 34. We all value them for all the good that they do. This Warrant Article is not designed to split sort of town meeting into one side and another side. Yeah, it's a resolution to bridge, to arrive at our common purposes. It is not punitive. I am in favor of hybrid town meeting and of supportive chats. I just think they'll be better and more effective if they are openly shared. I too am a lawyer and do not think this resolution is legally problematic, but more importantly, I hope it will help us toward more inclusive and more expansive deliberation. Please join me in voting in favor of this resolution. Ms. Bastian. Bonnie Bastion, town meeting member, Precinct 5, speaking in opposition. Over the past two years, supporters of Warrant Article 34 seem to have been wondering how so many Warrant Articles that they don't agree with keep getting passed. They're blaming political strategy made possible by these chat apps for tipping those scales. But what is at play here? What actually makes scales tip? Are elections and organizing around articles and making phone calls to convince others to take a similar position. That's called vote whipping. That is how politics works. I know this because after the recent elections, the scales have tipped in the opposite direction from where I want them to be in this town meeting. A lot of people that support the positions that I support were not elected this time around, and we are losing warrant articles left and right. Am I sitting over here getting suspicious of what the other side is doing in a chat in this moment? No, because I understand that political strategy is a thing. 
Warren Article 34 is one side looking to reveal the political strategy of another side. Political strategizing is happening among town meeting members in all camps before and during town meeting. And if you think otherwise, you are being naive. I ask you to look at the circumstances we are all trying to function in here. Town meeting is not clear cut or easy to understand and an enormous amount of power is wielded by the moderators because of the amount of discretion they are allowed. This makes it necessary to consider the impact of things pointed out as suspect in the listserv, like organizing when to call the question. Deciding in a chat if it makes sense to call the question at one moment or another is not nefarious. To be able to sway other town meeting members that are on the fence about an issue, we need to ensure all aspects of an argument are heard on the floor. This is helped along by organizing questions to be asked during debate. None of that is nefarious. This is how to be effective at arguing one's case. We have so little control on the floor of town meeting that strategy becomes a critical element of how to move people to vote. If you're worried about group think in a chat or about people relying on a chat to decide on how they will vote, this is not a chat problem. This is also happening at in-person town meeting. A solution is to elect more people with their own convictions that do their homework and ask questions. What, one minute. There is nothing being unveiled in a chat that is not already in a public conversation in Warren article hearings on social media or physically mailed to your house. This article is a push against how town meeting is being forced to change, but everything changes. The transparency that is needed across Brookline should happen well before town meeting in the form of emails describing in regular language and in multiple languages what we are voting on in town meeting. It's also public events where your constituents can show up, hear about Warren articles, ask questions, and hear your positions. It's inviting communication from your constituents throughout the year. That is transparency. That is representative town meeting. These chats are a tool for town meeting members to be able to function properly during town meeting. It's an accessibility tool. It's an accommodation for disabilities, an organizing tool, and a place to support each other. Please join me in voting no on Warren Article 34. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warren. And we'll next hear from Mr. Ananian, and then I'll take some comments and questions. Thank you, Mr. Assistant Moderator, Paul Warren, Precinct 1. I attended my first town meeting as a voter interested in a particular matter. I sat in the back of the auditorium and listened to the proceedings, including the debate and vote. Like many of our constituents, I knew nothing about the warrants, combined reports, public hearings, or the complex process and procedures that led to the public deliberation that was taking place before me. As a member of the public whose life, property, health, and well being would be directly impacted by the vote that was taking place that evening, I felt confident that I was hearing the same information that my representatives in town meeting were considering as part of their decision process. In fact, our form of legislating through a representative town meeting depends on deliberations that is transparent and accessible to both town meeting members and the public. Deliberation helps us as town meeting members think critically about the issues. Deliberation challenges us to consider different points of view. And importantly, deliberation informs our decisions before we cast our votes. The transparent nature of our deliberations ensures that we have the trust and confidence of the public as we make decisions on their behalf. Warrant Article 34 is a resolution and it does not have the power of law to stop anything. Instead, it simply encourages town meeting and the public to participate in the entirety of our proceedings and deliberations by inviting both parties 
to view large group electronic communications that are taking place while town meeting is in session. One minute. The public's confidence in town meeting is at a low point and calls for Brookline to become a city grow louder with each passing town meeting. Let's not exacerbate the problem by conducting substantive deliberations outside of the public's view. Please join me in voting yes on this article, Warren Article 34, as well as Warren Article 35 that opens up the TMMA list to the public. The public has a right to and deserves a fully transparent government. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ananian. Are you fixed? I hope so. Uh, I, my name is, uh, <clears throat> sorry, everything's fixed except the frog in my throat. Uh, Scott Ananian, town meeting member, precinct 10. Uh, I am a computer scientist. And uh, as such, I oppose reactionary measures against new communication technologies, which are targeted more at those who use the technologies than at transparency. There is nothing new here except some misplaced fear about those who use technology to make them more effective representatives. This article is almost a decade too late in its discovery of modern communications technology. Town meeting members have been using text messages and other aids to coordinate during town meeting for certainly as long as I have been a town meeting member and on every warrant article I've ever been part of. Um, town meeting members who bring warrant articles to town meeting have a reasonable desire to have an orderly debate and present their points well and without duplication. And I think people listening would prefer that they do so as well. Indeed, the alternative would be to disrupt the meeting with whispered conversations and questions, which I think most would agree would not be preferable. Placing a big uh, Brookline Interactive Group camera on the coffee pot in every home where more than one town meeting member is gathered in the middle of every group of newbie town meeting members who are asking questions about procedure, th this is just ridiculous. The wording is laughably vague about the liberation and about the duration of the prohibition, as Chi Chi Wu pointed out in her first uh, statement. It is an unprecedented restriction on Brookline citizens ability to discuss and learn about the issues in real time from their representatives, on the representative's ability to present their case to the best of their abilities and to otherwise be as well informed as possible the issues. With overly broad language, who are we delegating police powers to? Who exactly will determine what is a valid conversation and what is impermissible deliberation? I've heard phone notification bells beep in the background during numerous presentations. I've seen folks texting in their Zoom windows. Apple announced yesterday that editing and unsending messages would be brought to its messaging platform, just like a previous speaker claimed was objectionable. Do you use an Apple device? The only folks who are not afraid of the language in this article being used against them are those who are confident in their ability to use it as a club. The petitioner mentioned line drawing questions. That vagueness is exactly why you should vote against it. A vague line does not mean that you get to draw the line. It means you do not get to draw the line. It will be drawn for you by someone who is going to accuse you of wrongdoing based on the least charitable reading of this language. We've already One had minute. plenty of evidence of that. Thank you. We've been told that it's unenforceable, but it will be enforced. Every time your phone bell goes off or see what someone sees you texting in the auditorium or on Zoom, other town meeting members will be judging you. It will be used in debate as it was tonight, alleging that some town meeting members are not transparent or democratic as they seek to represent their constituents and argue for their beliefs. It is banning something which a number of folks have said is actively helpful to them as a town meeting member. The discussion here has, has led to questionable comparisons to open meeting law and campaign finance law. You may ask yourself why town meeting was explicitly exempted from, theirs, their, their, from these. There are good reasons why town meeting members are considered empowered voters in the application of these rules rather than elected officials. Please vote no on this resolution. It's unneeded, it's unnecessarily divisive, and will only lead to its use as a weapon and further uh, deteriorate the quality of town meeting. If you think it will never be used against you, please reconsider why you are so certain it will only be used against your opponents. I urge you to vote no for your own future sake. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Linos. Thank you so much, Assistant Moderator. My name is Natalia Linos and I am from precinct number six. I signed up for a question. My main question is why are we focusing on the during piece? And I think Marissa Vogt also asked that question. You know, I've only been a town meeting member for a couple of years, but some of the concerns that people have raised that there's back channel negotiations, authenticity versus orchestrated coordination, that deliberations, we have a responsibility to, you know, have deliberations open to the public. I agree with, but what I have experienced in the last few years as a town meeting member is that most of the deliberations happen before. People come prepared with written speeches. Everybody tonight has spoken with their written speeches. And after an hour of conversations, we're not speaking to each other. You know, I'm going off record because you know if we really want to have authentic de deliberations during we need to come to an agreement that we will never call the question 
that this is the opportunity to speak, or we agree that deliberations are actually happening before, and therefore we make those transparent. I do not believe that the deliberations that are happening during town meeting are really shifting our conversations in drastic ways. In terms of who, what you're gonna vote for, most people come to town meeting having decided that, having spoken to their constituents, having spoken to their friends. So I honestly think that we're, we're sort of mixing things up that the during is my concern. If we really wanna talk about norms, let's make it across the board. If we're really talking about a distraction, I think that's unfair. And let me speak just a second about something personal. You know, I work a full-time job. I have three young kids. I don't have time to engage, you know, all the time with town meeting outside. So I prepare for town meeting the day of. I read the word articles there. I sign up to speak as uh, the moderator, assistant moderator knows probably the day of. If you want people to not have deliberated, then you have to give them a chance to speak during. So my key question is, if we're limiting it to during, you're really forcing people to deliberate before so that they can be secretive, so they can strategize before. You're not changing anything about what people were do. So let's focus on the real question here, which is people seem intimidated because what, by what they don't know, but for new town meeting members, for those of us who have only been in a hybrid modality, most of us feel that there are so many conversations that are happening without us knowing about them because people have been town meeting members for 20, 30 years. You call each other, you text each other. I don't have phone numbers, so I'm grateful to be able to ask questions, to be able to think through things in real time, because actually that's the only time I have to, to commit to um, this town meeting, which I'm really glad to be part of. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Le Le Levy. Mr. Levy. I'm here. I'm having trouble finding my cursor on the screen. There you go. Um, my name is Mark Levy, Precinct uh, 7 Town Meeting Member. And unlike some of the previous speakers, uh, this is, I'm in now in my second millennium in town meeting. Uh, and I remember back when I was an organizer with the Brookline Tenant Union, I would have given my right arm, well, one of the fingers anyway, to have the kind of ability to contact people I knew were on my side to talk about strategy, to say whether, you know, if this vote fails, okay, what do we do now? And it wasn't always clear. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm basically coming down to the side of free speech, but I'm also recommending uh, a yes vote on the uh, resolution because all it is, is a sense of town meeting about whether we want um, side chats or not. Uh, as been pointed out, we're never gonna stop all side chats. And even with this passage, we're not gonna stop adding side chats when people wanna do it. But some people may be persuaded by a vote tonight to modify their behavior. Uh, I think that's the reason why it's, it's worth going through with this. If people vote against it, that's great. People vote for it, they'll be voting with me, which is not necessarily a, an incentive for anybody. But, uh, you know, let's not make this a tempest in a teapot, which we already have, I guess. This is not a huge matter of policy. This is not a huge matter of restraint of speech or open access to speech. It's about one resolution, which is basically a sense of what people in town meeting want to have happen, and it's unenforceable. And, uh, you know, let's not go overboard about this. So thank you very much. Listen, we've been going overboard for almost an hour, and I'll take Ms. Zimmerman's motion for the question. Is there a second? The motion has been seconded. Ms. Zimmerman moves to terminate debate. I have the following people signed up to speak in favor of this article, of this uh, motion. <clears throat> Ms. Gilman, Mr. Sh Spritz, Ms. Thal, Ms. Cavell, Ms. Albuquerque. I have uh, 
the following people lined up to, uh, uh, let's see, to Mr. Koltov for the question, Mr. Leotod with a question, M Ms. Leotod, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. Mr. Benson to speak against and Mr. Yassin with the question. A motion, uh, the a yes vote, if the yes vote prevails, we will terminate debate, go directly to a vote on the motion on, uh, in the words of the article, if um, the yes votes do not prevail by a two thirds vote, we will continue to hear from uh, those who want to be heard. We're ready for a motion, motion for the question. Have a count. Motion carries by a two thirds vote, 178 in favor, 51 opposed, and nine abstentions. On the main motion on pages 34 1 and 2, a yes vote will adopt this resolution. A no vote will uh, turn it down. We're ready for main motion, Article 34. Have a count, please. Motion carries by a vote of 116 in favor, 109 opposed, and 14 abstentions. Please turn to Article 26. The main motion under Article 26, moved by Ms. Richardson, seconded by Mr. Inanian, is on the Orange supplement number four, pages one to five. It's an extensive amendment of the bylaw relating to the Park and Recreation Commission. And uh, I have one important edit. The motion before you on, on page one of uh, supplement number four deletes the first sentence right after the title. That sentence should be Preserved. That is, it should not be deleted. Without that sentence, you don't have a, a context for the article. So the main motion will include that sentence. There is a motion to refer offered by Carla Banka, seconded by Mr. Gordon. It's on page five of the green supplement number one. Motion is to refer the subject matter of the article to the Park and Rec Commission with a request to report back to the fall 2022 town meeting. So we have a referral motion and a main motion. We start with a five minute video by three Brookline High School students who will identify themselves during the course of the video. They're speaking in favor of the main motion.
Hello, my name is Brian and I am a Brookline High School student and resident from Precinct 5. Brookline has been notoriously known for its increasing disparities in access to resources, including outdoor recreation. Financial aids in these programs are offered in limited amounts and are known to people who need them. Article 26 will reduce these disparities by promoting further support to increase youth engagements in these much needed enrichment opportunities. This can include financial aid, outreach programs, and language access. Hi, my name is Atlas and I'm a junior at BHS. I strongly support Warren Article 26 because this article is an important step in equity for Brookline. Every kid in this community deserves access to these programs and activities provided by the Parks and Recreation Department, but currently they do not. Warren Article 26 will fix that by providing financial aid to low-income families and families living in subsidized housing. Hi, my name is Tal Canetti. I'm a BHS junior and I'm speaking in favor of Warrant Article 26. I think it's incredibly important because I've been to a summer program that collaborated heavily with the Brookline Parks and Rec Department where we cleaned up parks, but we also talked about racial justice and then a lot of activism sparked from it. And there was this wonderful sense of community. And I think that everyone, all youth should be able to access that. And I don't think that there should be any barriers um, regarding income or your parents' income or anything like that. And I think that creating a commission to actually address that uh, because there is a disparity, I think that's incredibly important. Hi, my name is Elise. I'm a junior at Brookline High School. I support more in Article 26 because it is an important step towards equality in Brookline. It brings our community together by providing resources and opportunities to people who need them. It gives everyone a more common ground to grow on and experiences to share. We'll support the youth in, in the Brookline community by giving them experiences they might not have gone otherwise. Please support the Warren Article 26. Thank you. Hello, I'm Alice. I'm a junior at BHS, and I'm speaking in support of Warren Article 26. As young people in Brookline, this article will impact us greatly. It offers up to 100% financial aid for low-income families and residents of subsidized housing, which pertains to many of us, including our siblings, our classmates, and our friends. All of us should be able to participate in parks and recreation programming, regardless of our parents' income. This article is a really important step to advance equity in Brookline. I also want to urge everyone not to vote to refer this article to another committee, because that will just postpone it for way too long, and this is really pressing. We need it now, you know, not in one year, not in two. Thank you so much, and please vote for Warren Article 26. Thank you very much. You came in at under three minutes. Uh, town meeting is grateful. Ms. Benka, you have five minutes. Carla Benka, town meeting member, Precinct 14, speaking for the advisory committee. Article 26 seeks to impose a number of requirements on the Park and Recreation Commission, but the centerpiece of the article is the requirement that the commission ensure that low-income residents both adults and children can participate in recreation programs regardless of their financial status. The commission's current policy offers financial assistance for any program. While requests are generally limited to a 35% reduction of one program per child per season, larger reductions can be made at the director's discretion. Current sources of aid include the Recreation Revolving Fund, which supports programs through part participant fees and grants from the Brookline Community Foundation. Most financial aid is used for summer camp, whose fees this year top out at $285 per week. There are many other programs offered during the rest of the year, including eight weeks of Brookline Youth Soccer for $90, six weeks of swimming lessons for $135, and so forth. The Advisory Committee, Select Board, and Park and Recreation Commission support the goal of ensuring that recreation programs are available to all, regardless of income level. The social, emotional, and physical benefits are well documented and can be confirmed by just about any parent, guardian, teacher, or rec leader. So what's the problem? Why is the, rec the Advisory Committee recommended referral? Well, one of the problems is that we don't know the financial implications or impact of this article becoming a bylaw. The petitioners have noted that under the article, currently 1,089 students would be eligible for financial aid. And then based on that figure and a number of assumptions, 
they've developed a range of hypothetical costs. Although some of their numbers may be useful, more dependable numbers are needed. The petitioner's numbers apply to students, but the proposed bylaw refers to low-income residents. So what about adults? What's the size of the potential pool of kids and adults who might want to participate in rec programs? Of that number, how many would actually participate? Would any amount less than 100% in financial aid prevent them from participating? If recreation fees need to be increased to cover scholarships, at what point do those fees become so high that they prevent those who don't qualify for financial aid, but whose incomes have limitations from enrolling? And if program enrollment is robust, will there be adequate facilities and staff available to run the programs? Yes, this is getting into the weeds, but all of this information and probably more will be needed in order to get any realistic idea of what the ongoing budget implications would be of enacting this bylaw. Another point, a question town meeting members should be asking themselves is whether the objectives of this article should be a Park and Recreation Commission policy or a legal mandate. The article's principal petitioner has stated that policies are statement of what is intended to be done, but laws are formal and people have to obey laws. So consider for a moment what would happen if advocates for other programs requested that policies related to those programs be included in the town's bylaws. What would be the budgetary implications? Providing funds for what was legally required could lead to reducing funds for other town programs and services. Will the threat of such reductions lead to efforts to incorporate more policies into the bylaws in order to protect or expand other programs? To be absolutely clear, the advisory committee concurs with the petitioner's position that lack of funds should not prevent participation in the town's recreation programs, but more roll up your sleeves work is needed before an informed decision can be made by town meeting as to whether section 3.16 needs amending. Supporting a referral motion does not mean kicking the can down the road, and it does not mean that scholarship aid will be delayed for another six months. $500,000 in ARPA funds was recently allocated by the select board to the Brookline Community Foundation to be used specifically for recreation scholarships. Supporting referral does mean honoring the request of the Park and Recreation Commission for the opportunity to chart a path to meet the goals of the article and to convene a working group to assist them in their efforts. The commission should be given the time to get this right and come up with a successful plan. So by a vote of 19 to four with two abstentions, the advisory committee recommends that article 26 be referred to the Park and Recreation Commission with a report due back to the fall 2022 town meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Richardson. Good evening, Kimberly Richardson, uh, town meeting member, precinct two. Um, I'm a mother, I have, I'm a social worker, and I'll be speaking um, through both of those lenses tonight. Um, I plead with you with you all to vote no on the AC's motion to refer, and yes on the main motion. As a black woman, it's becoming increasingly difficult to come before town meeting or any place in Brookline to speak on issues of equity. It is troubling to speak, it is troubling for me to speak to people, to show them, I'm sorry, I'm super nervous, let me start over. Again, as a person of color, as a black woman, it is becoming increasingly difficult to come before a town meeting or any place in Brookline to speak on issues of equity. It is troubling for me to speak about my lived experiences, especially when it appears that no one is listening. When I keep telling myself this, that as an elected official that cares about making differences, differences, differences in the town, this is what I sign up to do, especially if I want change to occur. Although it keeps feeling like nothing changes, I will continue to share my voice until change comes. I have been extremely emotional thinking about how I had to come before this town meeting in order to make you understand the importance of recreational activities for our youth. It made me sad. Tonight, I have a different emotion. 
It has made me sad in the past, but tonight I have a different emotion. It's passion. And I'm passionate about this Warren article because it's personally affected my family. Tonight I'll be speaking to you through two different lenses. I will speak first through the lens of a social worker and then through the lens of a parent whose children who are unable to access the recreational activities that were beneficial to their socialization experience and their mental health. Studies show that children that participate in extracurricular activities from middle, from middle childhood to adolescence will have a positive youth development. The author contends that the transition from non-participation to participation shows that youth have better mental health and the child will more likely stay in the same activities from grade four to seven, causing them to make better connections to their peers. This connection will, allow, will only improve their mental health, not only improve their mental health, but children have an opportunity to learn how to socialize and make friendships. Another study shows that children who are having difficulties in life have the opportunity to be involved in community-based activities that are helpful with children. But often there's barriers to that participation like the cost of recreational fees. Fees are a huge problem for underpaid people living in poverty. During last year's town meeting, I had an opportunity to explain how the cost of internet was difficult for families. So imagine the ability to pay for recreational fees when they are even when they are reduced. Um, now we will share the through the lens of an underpaid single mom living in public housing in a very affluent community. As a single parent taking care of six school age children, there, these fees were not affordable to me. Even after the fees were reduced, before leaving Boston, my children my children were able to access recreational activities at the Boys and Girls Club for twenty five dollars a year. This is where my children learn how to swim for free. One of my sons joined the swim team. I could afford it because again, I, all I had to do was volunteer my time on a Saturday in order to pay for his swim supplies. When we moved to Brookline, I tried connecting him to swimming through Brookline Rec. I tried to connect him to, uh, to swimming through Brookline Rec, but it was not affordable. My son went from making the nationals in Florida to no longer swimming. His mental health declined, declined tremendously with him experiencing at least two hospitalizations. The following are his words. Moving to Brookline as a person of color was hard. I regret not having access to any recreational activities. I used to be an avid swimmer and it helped me with being young and queer. I had to give up swimming. And as a result, I found myself growing up way too fast and leaning on my older siblings and friends as a way to pass the time. I lost interest in swimming and sports, something I used to love doing. It was difficult seeing my white counterparts able to do things I wished I could do. I learned about my family's financial situation. I didn't ask for anything that was not absolutely necessary. Can you imagine telling your kid he can no longer do what he loves? Well, I had to tell that to more than one of my children. I'm asking you to vote favorable action and give these children the opportunity to experience what they need, what they deserve, what their fellow classmates have the privilege to, to participate in. Lastly, I would love to, I would love to know if any of you have ever had to tell your children, no, they can't participate in camp or other recreational activities like myself and many other parents. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Van Skoyat. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Van Skoyak speaking for a three to two majority of the select board who recommend referral of Article 26 to the Park and Recreation Commission. And I wish to quote from the combined reports and this language on Article 26, quote, there are few things as painful as feeling poor or excluded because of your income, especially for a child, unquote. That could have been a quote from the petitioners as you just heard in the eloquent presentation by, by Kimberly Richardson, but it happens to be from the report of the Commission on Town Organization and Structure. You will find similar language in the Advisory Committee report and in the report of the Parks and Recreation Commission and in the words spoken by the three to two majority of the select board when we debated this article. All of these bodies agree with the petitioner and thank the petitioner for highlighting the priority that must be given to those children in Brookline whose options are few, who suffer the pain of lack of access because family income is limited. However, all of the groups I cited, but not the petitioner, 
furthermore agree that the best path to serving those needs is to refer Article 26 to the Parks and Recreation Commission for action. What's more, the select board agrees with Town Ad Administrator Mel Kleckner and has so voted to allocate $500,000 in ARPA funds to the Brookline Community Foundation for the purposes of providing recreation scholarships over a two year period so that the Parks and Rec Commission can immediately this summer expand summer camp opportunities for Brookline children regardless of family income. Lack of funding and not lack of will <clears throat> has been the number one impediment to the Park and Rec Commission doing more than it already does. And it does a lot to make summer camps and other programs accessible to all children. As the advisory committee points out, the problem with the Article 26 approach, the bylaw approach to making free park and rec programming compulsory is, and I quote, things with a cost that are etched into a bylaw become budget issues with associated trade-offs or unseen hardships elsewhere, unquote. We have a good park and rec commission blessed with good appointees who stepped up to the plate to make decisions on programs in the best interests of all the families in town. As the petitioners of Article 26 themselves wrote in their report, accomplishing the goals of Art Article 26, quote, doesn't require reinventing the wheel. And we agree. One minute. Please join the select board and the advisory committee and the committee on town organization and structure and the Park and Rec Commission in saying yes to referring Article 26 to the Park and Rec Commission. Thank you very much. Thank you. I call on Ms. Greenwald, who will read a statement from Ms. Brown, who's indisposed and who is one of the principal petitioners. Ms. Greenwald. Yes, thank you, Mr. Assistant Moderator. Um, I'm Ann Greenwald, town meeting member from Precinct 8. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to speak tonight on in favor of Warren Article 26. The article will amend and update Article 3.16 of the Parks and Recreation Commission. Warren Articles 26 provides access to recreation programming and services for family with with limited financial means. Next slide, please. Why is recreation so important for families? Um, I'm not gonna go into this whole slide because Kimberly Richardson spoke to it very well, but um, recreation is very good for social emotional well-being as well as physical well-being. Uh, next slide, please. So who will benefit from implementing more in Article 26, the entire community. 14% of our Brookline students receive free and reduced lunch. Brookline Housing Authority has 354 children under the age of 18 who would benefit from this program. Disproportionate number of black and brown Brookline residents are living in poverty. Basically, uh, with the $500, $500,000 that ARPA has given to uh, the recreation department, 35, around 35 full scholarships will be available. This is about 10% of the students that we are looking to serve. Next slide, please. So the bylaw has been reviewed by the town council and the suggestions of the town council have been incorporated into the bylaw. It requires the commissioners to create a five-year comprehensive plan and provide annual updates. It also provide, uh, says that it will produce an annual youth engagement assessment and recommendations to increase participation amongst low-income families and families suffering from extenuated circumstances. Next slide, please. The bylaw defines who will benefit from the bylaw changes. It's low and moderate income tenants who reside in subsidized housing. It's those that um, 
are receiving sponsored rent subsidies or families you receiving SNAP or Section 8 housing. The bylaw is asking the commissioners to fundraise for the PR system. Next slide, please. Oh, okay, this is the wrong slide, I'm sorry. Um, okay. We understand that the bylaw expands the scope of the commission's work. And for this reason, we have asked that the commission and staff have time to thoughtfully develop a policy based on the bylaws new provisions. No one is expecting that the new provisions will be enacted over a summer or perhaps even the fall. We intentionally did not include a schedule because we thought it appropriate to leave that to the commissioners and staff. Next slide, please. So Warren Article 26 was crafted to require action and bring justice to residents. A policy guides government, but a law gives teeth to that policy. And it, it, it makes it so that we have standards and principles that have to be followed. A policy is not sufficient enough to correct the injustices that, that um, in, inequitable access to recreation programs creates. Next slide, please. So why we don't want a motion to refer. First of all, those who are requesting referral have said we need time. Well, we've put time into this bylaw. The commission will have time to develop a program. Also, referrals basically are letting families know that they still don't matter and that the children are, are missing out and we don't want to delay any things any more than we have to. Next slide, please. So the funding sources. Right now we have $500,000 that's been approved by the select board of ARPA money. That will last for two years. The Park and Recreation Department can evaluate and update its revenue schedule and hopefully pay for the program itself. Community development and block grants can be applied for select board funds such as the Marathon Fund and the Marijuana Fund can be applied for and other fundraising sources such as the Brookline Community Foundation. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, recreation is more than play. It has a public health benefit that's, that research supports. Town meeting is supposed to pass laws. A referral will hurt us and most importantly, hurt vulnerable Brookline families. And for this reason, we want you to vote no on the referral and yes on the main article. Thank you very much. Now, I've been uh, pretty lenient in uh, the time allocation to the two principal petitioners, Ms. Richardson and Ms. Brown, because they are the principal petitioners. They've uh, They've talked for five or six minutes. Not, neither of them asked for uh, extra time. And uh, I would just urge those of you who uh, <clears throat> need extra time to ask for it. I almost, I, and I'm sure the moderator almost always grants it. It certainly gives us a better uh, leg on how to plan the debate. Mr. Gordon. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Neil Gordon, Precinct One Town Meeting Member and a member of the Advisory Committee. No child should be denied access to public programs because they or their family can't afford a fee. I take that as a given, but that's not what has me speaking on this article. Petitioners argued in effect that bringing this long complex Warren article is the best path to their laudable end. They actually called it and I quote, the only way, it's not. Here's what a petitioner of Article 26 recently wrote to Article 26 proponents. Quote, show up and make your views known. If they don't hear from us, then they assume that what they're doing is fine, unquote. But during the advisory committee process, petitioners were asked if they had had a meaningful conversation with the Park and Rec Commission before filing what became Article 26. Sadly, no, not a bit. More recently, I asked a member of the commission for an update. 
the commissioner's response, and I quote, unfortunately, the petitioner has not reached out to have a dialogue slash conversation about it as promised, unquote. Most recently, very recently, I understand the petitioners may have spoken to several park and rec commissioners. That's just too little too late. We don't need to amend our bylaws. We need to have the conversation that should have taken place before the petitioners started drafting a long complex warrant article. Refer this article to park and rec it's where the subject matter of Article 26 has always belonged. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ashkenazi. Thank you. Um, Miriam Ashkenazi, uh, speaking on behalf of myself and Mike Sandman as the minority select board member voters on this Warren article, we are urging you to vote favorable action on the main Warren article and do not refer the negative impact of the pandemic on our children cannot be overstated. As the parent of both a ninth grader and a seventh grader, I am living it every day. The loss of social interaction, outdoor learning, playtime, and time with friends is something that we cannot recover for our kids, no matter how hard we try. But we must try. This Warren article creates space for our kids, literally and figuratively, to go out and play especially for those families that might not otherwise be able to afford to send their kids to costly summer camps and summer programs. According to the Child Mind Institute, the average American child spends four to seven minutes a day playing outside and seven hours in front of a screen. This warrant article is important and we can't just pay it lip service. The petitioners brought this issue to the attention of the Parks and Rec Commission in sufficient time for action but no substantive action was taken. Clearly, a policy is not enough. We can't leave this up to a commission. We need a bylaw. This needs to be a part of the fabric of Brookline. A bylaw requires action and ensures programming accessibility for our children. This is where we put our money, where our values are. I want to thank our town administrator, Mel Kleckner, the Brookline Community Foundation and the ARPA Review Committee for securing funding to be used to pay for summer programming for Brookline kids this summer. I wanna thank Lee Jackson and her team for working with community groups and the petitioners to make something work last minute for some of our families. But what I really want to do is to make sure we do this again next year and the year after and the year after that. Referring an article back to the commission whose direction the article seeks to change seems like an odd approach and although there's $500,000 grant from BCF for scholarships this year, this is not a guarantee that this support will continue. I'm gonna say it again, because it's worth it. This is One where minute. our money, where our values are. Thank you, moderator. We don't need to refer this back to the commission that already had the opportunity to get it done. We just need to get it done. We need to commit to the kids of Brookline we do that by voting favorable action on the petitioner's warrant article. Do not vote to refer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boers. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I believe you gave me six minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, Harry Boers, town meeting member, precinct three, speaking on behalf of the Committee of Town Organization and Structure. Article 26 addresses some very important priorities and needs in our community. And it also raises some complex structural concerns, which CTOS considered. The petitioner has been presenting this quite thoughtfully and quite forcefully, but it is not presented as a policy for the Park and Rec Commission, rather it's as a structural bylaw change. Specifically, the petitioner seeks to amend the current bylaw the town bylaw with a series of detailed focus changes and requirements, among them comprehensive planning, engagement assessments, new programming, and as we've heard, financial assistance of up to 100% for low-income families. Now, the Recreation Department does provide tuition assistance for its programs, but it's within the constraints of the revolving fund. And a revolving fund is self-supporting and doesn't pull funds from the town's general budget. Programs, therefore, can only succeed if they are tuition-paying participants. Tuition assistance is also funded from these tuition payments, limiting what is available. 
So the Recreation Department provides assistance based on family income, though we've heard that ranges only up to about 35% of the cost. And while they have said that no one who asked was denied a scholarship, what that doesn't tell us is how much financial strain was left or how many people simply didn't request support. The expenses are somewhat augmented with funds from the Brookline Community Foundation for the summer camp program. And as you heard, the town through BCF has committed an additional $500,000 in ARPA funds, but that's only gonna last for two years. This is not recurring revenue. And it's fair to assume there are many families who are unaware of the possibility for assistance, but for some, it may not be within the financial reach of the family, even with the limited assistance. We can't know all of the factors. We do know there are opportunities for greater outreach, and we also know there's remaining need to be served. So in addition to casting a light on an important set of issues, the article also demonstrates the complexity of formulating immediate solutions to problems that may still require some defining. It may require restructuring the recreation department relative to being a revolving fund. And this is not a trivial consideration. Accommodating more programs, more people, and offering assistance of up to 100% creates a number of obvious challenges, not the least of which is where does the money come from? Now, the petitioner estimates it's an additional $1.35 million annually. The work will clearly need to be done to understand the costs in the context of varied programmatic configurations. And costs, of course, are driven by numerous factors. There are as well capacity issues that limit participation. For example, the summer camp is limited to 300 participants because of space and facility constraints. If we were to add a few hundred more participants, additional facilities and staff would be needed, likely requiring the support of the school committee and the school department neither of which is contemplated in this proposed bylaw. And we know how scarce space in Brooklyn is in Brookline. So one can easily imagine a situation where there are more applicants than slots, in which case a model for set aside slots, first come for first serve, scaling within different programs or some other approach will need to be carefully devised. So it does come down to an issue of policy or bylaw. The petitioner contends that a policy says, we would like you to. Whereas a bylaw says you have to, and it certainly draws a stark distinction. Though policies can and do work well, allowing for a measure of flexibility to accommodate for unforeseen circumstances. The fire department has a long-standing policy of four in four, meaning four firefighters on site in four minutes. It's not a bylaw, it's a policy. It's taken very seriously. And likewise, the town's free cash policy provides an or orderly waterfall of distribution ensuring funds are regularly directed toward things like the Affordable Housing Trust. This bylaw change is very specific and focused, and it addresses a very important constituency. However, the change would also bring primacy within the bylaw relative to other potential constituencies. And so we must ask ourselves, is primacy essential or even advisable? Should we inscribe the needs of seniors specifically into the bylaws? What about the visually or physically impaired? And it raises a larger consideration as to the effect of bylaws in setting overall town policies and priorities, because as we've heard, things with a cost that are etched into a bylaw become budget issues with the associated trade-offs and unforeseen hardships elsewhere. And so a question, a question of parity naturally arises because changing bylaws can have either intentional or unintentional con consequences and it risks arranging the priorities of the whole community, not merely within the ambit of the recreation department. So in closing, the advisory committee is recommending this be referred back to the Park and Rec Commission and that the commission report back to this coming fall town meeting, believing a referral will give a little more time for all interested parties, including the petitioner, to sit down, properly reflect on the objectives and how best to accomplish them. The petitioner believes it should be a bylaw change now, seeing it as best leverage. And perhaps there are changes that should be made to the bylaws or will be made to the bylaws. But a bit of thought, deliberation, and discussion is not unreasonable. And it is, in fact, advisable before making such significant changes. So CTOS unanimously supports the referral motion by the advisory committee. And we look forward to a well-considered, informative report from the Park and Recreation Commission this fall 
to help guide us in arriving at constructive and durable solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jacobs. Good evening, Mr. Assistant Moderator. I'm Mike Jacobs, Chair of the Brookline Housing Authority. The Brookline Housing Authority Board of Commissioners doesn't normally take a stand on the warrant articles. However, at our May board meeting, the BHA Board of Commissioners voted to endorse warrant article 26 and any changes to the Brookline Recreation Department policies and procedures that would allow BHA residents to better afford town recreational programming. Uh, we just felt this article is just really critical to BHA residents. The Brookline Housing Authority staff and commissioners frequently hear from BHA residents that access to greater fitness, recreation and outdoor activities is critical and urgent. In a recent survey performed of tenants of our family developments by the BU School of Public Health, 59% of those responding identified recreation and enrichment programs as one of the most important child and youth services for people in the community. Currently, the Town of Brookline Recreation Department offers limited scholarships amounting to 30% of enrollment cost. This low level of scholarships prohibits many of the 354 children and families living in BHA properties from participating in recreation programs offered by the town. The average BHA income at family properties is $18,601. This makes it virtually impossible for most BHA families to, inform, to afford the cost of recreation programming. BHA parents emphasize that participation in after-school recreation activities would improve their children's quality of life and help families with limited after-school childcare options helping to further employment opportunities for parents. Warrant Article 26 seeks to change various bylaws related to the Towns Park and Recreation Commission in, in particular to seek to allow the BHA to directly provide evidence of financial hardship on behalf of residents to the town, reducing barriers to qualifying for Recreation Department scholarships by 2024. One minute. These these changes will allow BHA families as well as tenants living in subsidizing housing to better access and afford the Town of Brookline recreation offering and ultimately improve resident quality of life in Brookline. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Ames. Uh, thank you, Mr. Assistant Moderator. Uh, my name is Wendy Sheridan Ames, town meeting member in Precinct 5. I'm also a member of the Park and Recreation Commission. I'm a parent of three students in Brookline Public Schools. And I first want to thank the petitioners, in particular lead petitioner Deborah Brown, for her efforts and commitment to the important work related to Warrant Article 26. I'm also going to go off script for a second and say thank you to Kim Richardson. Um, thank you, Kim, for speaking honestly about your personal experiences today. And I hear you, I really hear you. And um, whether Warrant Article 26 is referred or passes, you have my personal commitment to do all I can to advocate for funding. Um, with that said, um, I'm speaking on behalf of the Park and Recreation Commission now and all of the commissioners, including myself, fundamentally support the goals in amended section 3.16.3 titled Parks and Recreation Affordability. We agree that the Parks and Recreation Commission, the Recreation Department, and our town as a whole must do better to support the mission of affordability and equitable access to recreation. As some of you might remember, the Brookline Community Foundation produced a report pre-COVID back in 2019 that was titled Advancing Access in Out-of-School Time Hours. Their report stated that 70 town leaders and providers affirmed the critical importance of quality out-of-school time programs 
and agreed that the current resources are not meeting the needs of all kids and families. And this was before the pandemic. The need is even greater now. This is a townwide issue and we need to work together to solve this and to fund it. We know that school time activities, including recreation and sport, contri contribute positively to the health and well being of children. The Park and Recreation Commission, however, feels that amended section 3.14.4, titled Park and Rec Funding, didn't include the appropriate level of detail required to make these critical goals a reality. We need to figure this out. We believe all Brookline kids should have access to summer camp and rec soccer and basketball and Lego engineering and all of the available programs. But we need to have a robust plan. We need to spend time on it, give focused attention to it, the funding and implementation strategies to actually support the goals of affordability and equitable access. For these reasons, on May 10th, the Park and Recreation Commission voted six to zero with one member absent to recommend that town meeting refer the matter of warrant article 26 to the commission with the intention that the commission will create a task force to include members uh, from the commission as well as representatives from the commission on diversity inclusion and community relations the school committee brookline housing authority and the committee on town organization and structure Additionally, the commission would welcome participation by interested groups, local nonprofits, individuals, and in particular, we look forward to working with the original petitioners to achieve common goals by developing strategies that can be quickly implemented. Please vote yes on the motion to refer Article 26 to the Park and Recreation Commission to report back by fall town meeting. Thank you. Mr. Tumayo, you have four minutes. T T A M A Y O. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you so much, Mr. Assistant Moderator Carlos Mario Tamajo, Precinct Two. Good evening, everyone. Warren Article Twenty Six is deeply personal to me. Growing up, I had so many interests, but every time I'd research on cool after-school programs in summer camp like theater, band camp, sports, travel abroad, the price was always a barrier, even with financial aid. And that's because when you're living paycheck to paycheck, like my family, you have to think about every dollar you spend. And, you know, when you have to pay rent, phone bills, that's the price you want, Xfinity, gas, even groceries, not everyone who's low income qualifies for food stamps, unfortunately you're not left with very much for recreational programs. And don't even get me started on the impact of inflation. The one time I did participate in a recreational program, it was through the Art Barn Community Theater in Coolidge Corner in 2010. Even though it was a huge sacrifice for my family, we had to pay a lot of money for me to participate. It was a magical experience. We had so much fun performing the Nightingale at center communities of Brookline Senior Living and even the Coolidge Corner Theater. Every child, including low income and people of color children, deserves to feel special and powerful the way I did when I was at Art Barn. I'll never forget how proud my Colombian parents were to see their son on the same stage as the children of Brookline that chilly night in January of 2010 at the Coolidge. But even with my theater directors encouraging my parents to move me to a more advanced community theater program, the costs ended my acting dreams as well as the friends I had made through the program there that night. It was also the last time I felt like I was a part of the Brookline community before I was elected to town meeting this past May. After Art Barn, I did what many low income immigrant children do. I focused on school and eventually earned a full ride to college. But in high school, as one of the few low income persons of color there, I realized that for wealthy white children, it's so normal to spend thousands and thousands every year and every summer on recreational programs. 
this is an issue of equity because the racial disparity is enormous. I saw it. But we have the power to get that ball rolling tonight. If we want to ensure that communities of color and low-income people like me can become active contributing members of this community, we need to nurture their interests by providing accessible recreational programs and financing beginning from early childhood. Because education is not just about what you learn in the classroom, it continues after school and over the summer. A well-rounded education is about the mind, the body, and the soul. I urge you to vote favorable action on Warrant Article 26 and no on referral. The petitioners have worked so incredibly hard and Ms. Deborah Brown has already secured $500,000 to get this going. We have the money for at least two years. We have the need. We just need to get the ball rolling. If we want people of color and low income people like me to believe in themselves, we need to believe in them. Finally, with regards to previous comments on space constraints being a potential issue with this warrant article. Hi, my name is Carlos Mario Tamayo Avendaño. I am Latino. I am low income and I am here to take up space. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pelkey. Go ahead. Yeah, okay, I just wanted to get unmuted. Thank you. Um, my name is Linda Olson Pelkey, town meeting member, precinct 17. I agree with the petitioners that access to parks, playgrounds, and natural areas are critical for the health and well being of our residents. I also agree that equity of access to these resources is a serious issue, and also that shared public spaces, such as parks, are a critical part of our social infrastructure that fosters social cohesion and robust civic life. In fact, studies have shown that in a crisis, such as a severe heat wave. It's the communities with strong social infrastructure that fare much better and are more resilient. Parks are the outdoor space for those of us who don't have a yard of our own. And the pandemic really brought home just how critical these green spaces are to our well being. We do have a park access equity problem, with some areas really coming up short when it comes to per capita park space are having sufficient tree canopy. But how we should we address that disparity? Does it make sense to try to improve access to nature by funding participation in structured recreation programs? I'm not so sure, but we've heard some good cases for that tonight. I draw a different conclusion from the statistics and arguments presented. I think we should be investing in more open space and sanctuary lands, more parks and recreation spaces, more tree canopy, and even some green infrastructure. And we should be directing those investments to the environmental justice areas in town as part of our comprehensive land use planning. We know where the worst heat islands are and we can identify the areas where there's a severe per capita deficit for play or passive open space. We have begun generating CPA funds that can help fund these green investments that would bring permanent benefits for the entire community in terms of access to nature, play, and community building. I also agree with those who say that funding recreation programs for low-income residents is a budget and policy manner that doesn't belong in a bylaw. It's clear that determining the demand for and capacity for our rec programs need further studying. Some funds have been dedicated to supplement the fees. And clearly, if we've learned anything from our turf debate, it is that we have severe capacity constraints on recreation facilities. For these reasons, I support the advisory committee motion to refer this article to the Parks and Rec Commission. Let's ask Park and Rec to plan how to improve access for all populations, but let's also plan for the long term by funding more nature based public spaces. Please vote. <clears throat> Please vote for the advisory referral motion on Article 26. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sandman. Um, hold your call for the question. We're going to have 
hear from two more speakers. Ms. Bernard. Don't go away though. Good evening. My name is Lauren Bernard. I'm a Precinct 17 town meeting member. And I also am a co-petitioner on this article. And I will tell you why, because not only does it mean a lot to me, I'm here to tell you that this is infinitely doable. Why? Because I've done it. I currently am the executive director of DACEP, the daily after school enrichment program at the Florida Ruffin Ridley School. It's, this is clearly deja vu for me because almost exactly the same thing happened to me and to our program in 2015 and 2018 as what happened now. <clears throat> DACEP is an independent 501c3 nonprofit organization that provides a full range of after school enrichment programming to all students at the Florida Ruffin Ridley School who wish to participate, regardless of family's financial standing. We deliver engaging, high quality programming, just like Brookline Recreation, not just like, but on par of quality, different programs though. And we offer virtually unlimited enrollment to students in grades K through eight. And we provide tuition assistance for all qualifying students. Was it always like this? No, the program has existed for about 34 years. What happened in 2015 when I became executive director, my board of directors issued a mandate, a lot like a bylaw, make this accessible to all students apply for grants, apply for funding, figure it out. And that's exactly what I did. <clears throat> As an independent 50C3 nonprofit organization, we can solicit donations. We intended to serve the school community, as I said, regardless of their family's ability to pay. Currently, we are the district's largest after-school program serving over 300 students a year <clears throat> over 250 per session, and we offer 40 plus activities and classes. Now, Ms. Bernard, this yeah. is all very interesting and, uh, and uh, it's wonderful, but uh, what does it have to do with the- I'm getting um, to that. Okay, it, well, you have uh, approximately 45 seconds to get to it. Ah, <clears throat> well, let me skip to another section. Basically what I'm saying is that when I'm given a mandate, we found a way in our program to finance students through raised tuition for families that could afford it after securing grant money to figure out exactly how many students this meant. This is very much like the situation that Article 26 seeks to address. We have secured ARPA funding for $500,000 that allows for 35 children in low income situations to go to camp and allows the Recreation Commission and others to figure out how to keep it going. That was exactly the situation we faced and that's exactly the situation that the, Depart the Recreation Department and Commission are facing. What I'm saying here is that when given a mandate, we come through. We came through, they can come through. What, what I, it's also saying is that the necessity importance of this programming can't be understated and it can be done. If I was able to do it for a school of 800 to 900 st students, I believe that the Recreation, Parks and Recreation Commission and the Recreation Department is capable of doing this for the needy students of our town. Please vote yes on Warren Article 26 and no for referral. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, we'll hear from Ms. O'Connor, who's chair of Park and Rec, as the last speaker before I take Mr. Sandman's motion for the question. Ms. O'Connor. Nancy. Good evening, everyone. Um, I have my three minutes, but now I have about 30 more minutes after listening to all of these passionate speakers. Nancy O'Connor, Vice Chair of the Park and Recreation Commission. Um, very briefly, I wanted to share that growing up in Brookline, 
Uh, I was, my family was a recipient of uh, some assistance from the recreation department. Uh, my sisters and I were able to attend summer camp a year or two. Uh, we met many youths from all over town um, in our little neighborhood, had a very extensive group that participated. So it was just like being on the local corner. One of my most prominent memories was that I was never able to win at Foursquare. I mean, never serve, one serve and I'm out but it didn't stop me from going back and standing in line. So these opportunities are very, very important to me and the commission. And I know that the Park and Recreation Commission and the department also know the value and importance of broadening participation. In my first remarks about this during Park and Rec um, and all the meetings that we, that we met at um, or sat in on, I envisioned a creating a working group of people from Park and Rec, BHA, Steps to Success, reps from school departments, school committee, and other connected groups. This group would help to identify families in need, desirable programming beyond just summer camp and funding opportunities. Beyond summer camp includes sports opportunities, after school programming, even programming in local parks, just the way we did back in the 70s, if I can age myself, of course, doesn't take much. Bringing programming local. It sounds like the first steps have been taken in the recreation department, along with some key community members organized by Ms. Brown, thank you, Deborah, have started this important work. Maybe we can hear more of this from the, uh, the Director of Recreation. I know that the Commission and the Recreation Department are committed to expanding this idea to include not just a summer camp, but additional recreation programs. However, this endeavor must be, in su be supported by the entire town. The Recreation Department runs programming out of a bank of offices, but has no rec center. We depend on the generous assistance from the school department for use of their facilities, and we also use parks. Offering summer camp program, programming is not just recreation setting it up. It actually takes many departments coming together to make it work. I guess you could say it takes a village or a whole town. If we are to change the bylaws, I would ask that we review the article further for either slightly different, slightly different wording or maybe stronger wording. Let's be clear on the expectations of the commission as well as where the funding might be coming from. We all want this or expect this endeavor to be successful. And I think Wendy, uh, Sheridan Ames spoke to that, how passionate we both are about this. We do have some ARPA money, and I hope that it does go to scholarship funding to get us through the next couple of years. It gives us time to find solid funding sources and solid programming. The commission will act on this, whether this article goes through or not goes through because it is very, very important. We oppose a favorable action vote because that would dictate the details of a policy without knowing the feasibility, cost, or funding source. And there is work to be done to ensure success. I urge you to vote yes to refer the Warren article on 26. And I thank you all very much for your time and enthusiasm for this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sandman moves the question. Is there a second? Motion has been seconded. I have the following people signed up to speak in favor of the petitioner's motion. Uh, Dr. Fisher, Mr. Spritz, Ms. Neufeind, Ms. Frias, Dr. Linos, Ms. Greenwald, Ms. Yu, Wu, I'm sorry, Ms. Schweitzer, Ms. Bastian, Ms. Takanami, Ms. Schatz, Mr. Ananian, Ms. Felberg, Ms. Felberg, Mr. Benson, Mr. Grossman, Mr. Penzel. I have no other speakers signed up to speak for referral. And uh, I have uh, the, Ms. Cavell with a question, Mr. Shea with a comment in favor of the petitioner's motion, Ms. Priestley with a question, Mr. Ms. Goodwin with a question, Ms. Thal with a question, Mr. Kushner, uh, with a comment in favor, and Mr. Wang with a comment. Against that background, uh, this is a motion to terminate debate. Uh, if you vote and if the motion carries, debate will be terminated and we will proceed directly to the referral motion, which will be the first motion. 
and if that fails to the main motion. Uh, <clears throat> a, if the uh, motion for the question fails and requires a two thirds vote, we will continue hearing from uh, those who were signed up to speak and those in the queue. So we're ready for a motion for the question. Yep. Voting period has commenced. All right, may I have the vote, please? 165 yes, 72 no, 5 yes. Motion carries by a two thirds vote, 165 in favor, 72 opposed and five abstentions. On the motion to refer to the Park and Rec Commission, if you vote in favor of this, that will terminate the proceedings under this article and we'll proceed to article 27. If the referral motion fails, we will then vote on the main motion of the petitioners on the orange supplement number four. Referral motion, Article 26. Have the vote, please. 127 yes, 112 no, four abstentions. Motion carries by a vote of 127 in favor, 112 opposed, and four abstentions. We now proceed to Article 27. <clears throat> the motion under Article 27 is at the bottom of page 27-4 over to 27-9 moved by Ms. Smith, seconded by Mr. Richmond to amend the leaf blower bylaw to essentially uh, eliminate leaf blowers, as you will hear more in more detail. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Warner, you have 10 minutes should you need them. Thank you, Mr. Assistant Moderator. I'm Don Warner, town meeting member, precinct 13. I, along with Maura Toomey, precinct eight, Clint Richmond, precinct six, and Virginia Smith, precinct four, are the co-petitioners for Warren Article 27. Next slide, please. The Massachusetts Constitution says the people should have the right to clean air and the freedom from excessive and unnecessary noise. Gas powered leaf blowers have denied Brookline residents these rights. Warren Article 27 will better regulate and significantly reduce the use of gas leaf blowers. It will reduce disruptive noise levels and harmful emissions and pollutants. It will bring Brookline a step closer to net zero carbon emissions by 2030. Next slide, please. We should not have to tolerate the harmful effects of gas leaf blowers. The current bylaw has not been effective in regulating the use of gas blowers. 
Many commercial landscapers do not comply with the regulations. They either ignore them or find ways to work around them. Just drive around the town and you will see that blowers are still being used six weeks into the seasonal ban. And the current fines are just not strong enough to change landscapers' behavior. Next slide. Warren Article 27 proposed amendments are as follows. It clarifies that walk behinds leaf floors are included in the bylaws. It clarifies that a commercial operator is any individual or entity providing landscaping services for a fee. It codifies that commercial operators must be permitted annually by the town prior to allowing anyone to operate leaf floors. And it codifies that a list of permitted commercial landscapers will be available to all property owners or managers so that residents can make informed decisions as to who they use for those services. Next slide, please. Warren Article 27 adds that a commercial operator must train all employees under provisions of the bylaw. It adds that starting March 15, 2026, no gas powered leaf blowers can be used on properties with less than one acre of open space, except for town owned properties. And it gives commercial landscapers and homeowners four years to prepare and convert to battery powered leaf blowers. Next slide, please. The Warren article increases fines for penalties from $50 to $200 for second violations, $100 to $300 for third violations, and $150 to $300 for subsequent violations. These penalties are accrued in total regardless of location and rolled over from year to year. Landscapers do not get a clean slate at the end of the year and start all over again. These violations need to be recorded properly. And permits are suspended after the fourth violation. Next slide, please. The hazards of gas leaf blowers are as follows. They produce the same level of hydrocarbons in less than 30 minutes than a mid-sized truck driving over 500 miles. They discharge harmful substances such as carbon monoxide, volatile organic compounds, and particular matter, which can cause respiratory problems. They let out noise le levels that are disruptive, debilitating, and can penetrate house walls and windows from over 300 feet away. And most alarmingly, they harm the health of the landscape workers, many of whom are minorities who suffer the greatest exposures. Next slide, please. The benefits of battery powered blowers are as follows. No air pollution, toxic solid waste or fuel spills, no carbon emissions, much quieter than, quieter than gas blowers, as powerful as legal gas blowers, and they cost less to operate than gas blowers. Next slide, please. Commercial batteries are now being produced that have long run times. Battery technology will advance even further over the next four years. Costs of batteries will decrease while the price of gas and oil will continue to go up. And as clean energy sources such as solar panels expand, the electricity used to charge the batteries will rely less on fossil fuels. Next slide. The steel company is a major manufacturer of battery and gas blowers used by many local landscapers. This is a comparison of their battery and gas blowers. The battery blower is a BGA 200, the gas is the BR 500. The airspeed of these two blowers are the same. The weight is the same. The equipment cost is the same. The fuel cost per 1,000 hours, that's what two years uh, uses typically, is $100 for electricity and $1,700 for gas and oil. And a replacement battery cost is $1,000. Typically, these are replaced every two years. For a total two-year fuel cost for batteries of $1,100, battery blowers rather, 
and for gas blowers, $1,700. So you can see it's actually less money to use a battery powered leaf blower. Next slide, please. The impact that Warren Article 27 will have on landscape workers is as follows. As documented by the CDC and EPA, it will protect workers who are directly exposed to deafening noise levels and dangerous exhaust fumes of gas powered blowers. These workers will not be laid off or fired. Nationally, there is no evidence that landscape workers will lose their jobs converting to battery powered blowers. The work will still need to be done and landscape companies cannot afford to lose their employees. Next slide, please. Despite claims to the contrary, landscapers are not going to leave Brookline and find work elsewhere. They are for-profit companies and Brookline is a lucrative market for service businesses. In fact, 10 years after several municipalities in California banned leaf blowers, a report from the Santa Monica Office of Sustainability and the Environment stated that bans do not have detrimental fiscal consequences. In none of the cities which have already banned blowers, is there any evidence of financial hardship to landscapers? Next slide, please. Adding a full-time position to better enforce this bylaw should have a neutral impact on the town's budget. This position would be paid for by year-round enforcement citations, such as public way obstructions at construction sites, sidewalk snow removal violations, as well as leaf blower violations. This position will also provide better service for the residents of Brookline, Clearly a benefit for all. Next slide, please. Municipalities across the country have enacted strong leaf blower regulations. Those include Washington, D.C., Large Mart, New York, and Chevy Chase, Maryland, to name a few. Locally, Lexington and Arlington this year voted to ban gas powered leaf blower equipment with Warren Articles very similar to Warren Article 27. Next slide, please. Warren Article 27 has been endorsed by Climate Action Brookline, Green Caucus, Green Space Alliance, Massachusetts Sierra Club, PACS, First Parish and Brookline Climate Justice Committee, and the advisory committee was only one vote away from favorable action. One minute. Next slide, please. Please vote favorable action on Warren Article 27. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I need to correct uh, my description of this uh, uh, proposal, obviously. It only applies to gas-powered leaf blowers and not other kinds. Uh, Mr. Readers, you have five minutes. Thank you very much. Stephen Readers, Advisory Committee member at large, speaking for the Advisory Committee. Uh, the regulation of leaf blows in the town has been studied and debated extensively, leading to the bylaw of 2016 that currently regulates the operation of blows in the town. This year, the Advisory Committee again received a lot of public comment, consulted DPW, and gave careful thought to warrant Article 27, which would ban the use of gas powered leaf blows from March 2026. The idea is that electric blowers will take their place. By a narrow margin, the advisory committee voted to recommend no action on warrant article 27. Noise pollution from yard machines is clearly a real irritation for many folk. Committee members were likewise largely in favor of addressing noise nuisance and improving compliance with the current law. While consumers can make do with low power machines for small lots, contractors need power to achieve efficiency. We did find that there is now one professional grade blower made by the company Steel, as noted by the petitioner, that has the power to match conventional machines. However, our research and input from public hearings led to the practical concern that electric blowers are not currently feasible for professional use. What are the practical issues with electric leaf blowers? 
First, the life expectancy of electric leaf blowers, motors and batteries alike is unknown. DPW, which is transitioning to electric devices, told us that the life of one to two years is currently expected, but we could not find long-term testing data on the durability of electric blowers. Second, sadly, neither the batteries nor motors are recyclable. After perhaps one to two years of useful life, batteries will have to go into toxic waste and much of any environmental benefit will be lost. Third, and most important, each charge only lasts 90 minutes on full power, even when the device is new, even according to the manufacturer. This is for the most powerful professional grade battery packs, which cost well in excess of $1,000. As the batteries age, moreover, and as with all rechargeable batteries, the use from a single charge will diminish. So commercial landscapers will need several batteries for each crew member for a day's work in the spring cleanup and fall seasons. The economic burden we believe will be substantial. Every contractor who spoke to us opined that electric leaf blowers won't be practical when the proposed law comes into effect. We also heard directly from yard workers who are of the same view. Some residents had bought new gas powered blowers to comply with a recent change in town bylaw and thought it unfair that they will be faced with buying a new machine. Some residents also were puzzled by the focus on leaf blowers when there are many other sources of yard noise that are not being addressed. Other homeowners expressed concerns that they will lose their yard service if landscapers conclude that it is just too expensive to be compliant with the gas blowers at the time that it will become effective. Among those residents supportive of the ban, lack of compliance with current bylaw was a frequent concern. The advisory committee was sympathetic to the need for better compliance. The petitioners are recommending a number of changes to improve compliance, including the highest fines allowed by state law, $300 per violation, and having violations roll over and accumulate year after year, as you've heard. But it's unclear whether imposing punitive fines will improve compliance. Data on the effectiveness of big fines in California is mixed. No motion was made at the advisory committee meetings to consider the petitioner's article as currently presented. However, in response to the input we, re we received, the advisory committee considered a change to the effective date of the proposed ban from the current as proposed to 2027. Nonetheless, that vote narrowly failed. And so by a vote of 11 in favor, 12 opposed and three abstentions, the advisory committee recommends no action on warrant article 27. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Andrew Fisher. Uh, I have... Um... You're uh, going to tell us who you are, of course. Oh, I'm sorry, Andrew Fisher, town meeting member, precinct 13. Um, and I have um, personal experience that's inconsistent with what Mr. Readers just presented in that um, we had a landscaper who uh, some years ago who uh, protested when I suggested to him that uh, I, didn't want to, I didn't want him using uh, um, gas-powered leaf blowers. I said, whatever extra you need to charge, you can charge. Um, although he protested, he stopped using le um, his gas-powered leaf blowers on my in my yard. He didn't charge me anymore. The quality of the work was the same. He's since retired. The, the party that replaced him, the company that replaced him, uh, made the same accommodation, was able to do the work with no extra charge. I now have a green landscaper who has, uh, and could uh, I have slides. Could I have the one slide, Mr. Moderator? Um, a green landscaper who uh, not only doesn't use uh, gas, gas powered uh, uh, leaf blowers, but doesn't use gas powered lawn mowers or, or weed whackers. Uh, in fact, all the work is with, done with electric uh, rechargeable batteries. Um, I find it, not only do, does he do better work, but his uh, way of approaching uh, yard maintenance uh, in harmony with the environment is um, greatly appreciated. Uh, he's one of uh, a list of um, landscapers who provide 
services um, that are green that uh, without any use of any um, gas powered uh, machinery. And uh, the list is on the screen. Um, I, I think the uh, time has come when we can retire uh, fossil fuel powered leaf blowers and other lawn equipment. Um, the list here speaks for itself. It's a list that's been provided by uh, um, City of Newton um, Green Group. Um, and uh, I've used at least two of these uh, providers and find them quite adequate. Uh, there's no need for, there's no need at all for electric, uh, for a gas powered leaf blowers uh, in today's, today's world. There's no need for the noise. There's no need for the pollution. There's no need for the carbon emissions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pelkey. Thank you very much. Linda Olson Pelkey, town meeting member, precinct 17. Sorry, Andy, I'm gonna have to disagree. <laughs> um, I'm asking you to vote no on article 27. I don't like the noise or pollution from leaf blowers either. And I strongly favor switching to electric only blowers when the time is right. But for now, we would be much better off sticking with our current leaf blower bylaw and bringing a straightforward required switch to electric when the technology is ready. So what's wrong with the article as proposed? For starters, it sets an arbitrary date in the distant future for the switch to electric. We don't know if that date makes sense. Will the battery packs be light enough and powerful enough by 2027 or 2026 to allow a landscaper to work a full day? Will the technology be ready sooner? We don't know. But at the advisory committee, we heard from the DPW commissioner that the current electric leaf blower options are not usable all day. We should wait until the products that are acceptable substitute exist before adopting a mandate. But, but what's even more problematic with this article is the intricate and Byzantine bureaucracy it sets up. We already have problems enforcing the current bylaw because of its complexity. Number of blowers on a certain lot size, times of year when blowers can and cannot be used, required decibel levels, multiple departments tasked with enforcement and punishing fines. The proposed changes add to that long list the requirement that landscaping companies register with the DPW each year and the fines for violators are being ramped up and target property owners. The DPW asks for an additional staff position for code enforcement in this year's budget, but this position was not funded, thus making enforcement an unfunded mandate. It just minute. feels like too much heavy handed bureaucracy and punishment for property owners and commercial landscapers. Once again, Brookline makes it harder for honest business people to work in Brookline. Finding condominium residents because their overworked management company did not succeed in getting the landscapers they hired to follow all of these Byzantine rules just doesn't seem fair and it will not have the desired effects. We might succeed in driving some landscaping companies out of Brookline, but I doubt doubling down on the bureaucracy and punishment is a good use of our town staff's limited time and energy. We should just make it much simpler by adopting a straightforward requirement for using only electric blowers when they are up to the job. Let's say no to this excessively bureaucratic version, stick with the regulations on the books for now and pass a clean, simple requirement to use only electric when it's the right time to do that. Please vote no on Article 27. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Hollowell. And uh, Ms. Bowman, I'm not gonna take a motion for the question right now. Hollowell. Okay. Is it my turn? It is. Benedicta Howell, town meeting member of precinct 15. Um, this will probably be my 30th meeting on leaf blowers. And funny enough, I would be exempt from this with over an acre, but this matters a lot to me. It matters a lot to everybody else. And it's a tool that should be used and kept in the toolbox. A leaf blower is much like a snow blower, 
chainsaw, weed whacker, screwdriver, Phillips head, whatever. It belongs in the garage for those who need it. It's a tool and it's a modern day tool and it's brought us a long way from raking, which is a fun thing to do, but not when you have a lot of work. Um, again, this is probably the 30th meeting on this and I don't wanna take up too much time, but I have said it before and I know that it's true. I have heard people say that they will cut down trees to avoid paying the extra fees to rake leaves. I know lots of people have said it, they're just gonna cut down trees and that is really going in the wrong direction. As well as now that we don't have much rain and we've got all this pollen, I've got a lot of allergies. I like to use my leaf blower to blow the green right off my doorstep so I don't bring it inside and sneeze all day long inside. I'm not, I don't wanna use water. That would be absolutely wrong to, to wash off the pollen. I think that there's a, a lot of other people have spoken about the various other aspects of it, but I believe that we should be allowed to have and keep our tools in our toolbox and all of our landscapers and all the people who want to use it until the technology is ready and we've got the batteries. I was part of all these tests on the leaf blower committee and the batteries are just not there. They last for 45 minutes. They're weak. You would need a lot of them. So please, I urge you all to vote no on this until the tools are ready that we can use to make everybody happy in the environment. Thank you. Well, Ms. Hollowell, I had you in the wrong column. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so I'll, uh, we'll hear from uh, uh, Shura Fisher and then Ms. Michaels. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Shira Fisher, town meeting member, precinct 11. And since it seems relevant, I'm professionally trained in medicine and epidemiology and now work in health policy. I wanna speak briefly to the health effects that gas powered leaf blowers have on the workers who use them, most of whom are minorities and the people who walk by as well. There are three kinds of health hazards of gas powered leaf blowers, noise, exhaust emissions, and partic particulate or dust. I won't go into too much detail about each one, but first of all, unsafe noise levels, leaf blowers, um, gas leaf blowers typically operate between 70 and 100 decibels in the range of a jet taking off at close range can cause tinnitus, hearing loss, contribute to hypertension, and coronary heart disease. The CDC, as Don Warner noted, specifically lists gas powered lawnmowers and leaf blowers as a source of loud noise that can cause hearing loss with repeated exposure. Um, the EPA has shown that leaf blowers and other gas powered lawn and garden equipment expose workers and the public to high levels of toxic and carcinogenic carcinogenic emissions, such as benzene, butadiene, formaldehyde, and fine particulates, um, and carbon monoxide. Those holding them are obviously the most exposed. Um, as the Wall Street Journal put it, children playing outdoors and people who work from home frequently contend with this menace, but landscapers suffer the most. Um, and a 2011 study found that a consumer grade leaf blower emits more pollutants than a 6,200 pound 2011 Ford Raptor, um, according to a study conducted by Edmonds, the car website. So of course, in the leaf blower case, the user is not in the driver's seat, but sitting right next to the exhaust pipe. Um, in short, the operators of leaf blowers are exposed to all these health risks at much higher levels than those who just walk by. The worker faces extremely high concentrations of carbon monoxide, particulate matter. Um, and this is all the more relevant when we're in the midst of an upper respiratory virus epidemic. Researchers at the Harvard School of Public Health found that a small increase in long-term exposure to PM2.5, which gas blowers spew out, can lead to an increase in the COVID-19 death rate. So today, with more people working at home, um, and with landscapers who can't follow the current law because they can't keep track of it. There was one who told me across the street, oh, I didn't know I was in Brookline or the one, one next minute. door, the one next door today who said that he wouldn't tell me what company he worked for, that he works for himself and that he didn't know that there was a rule. Basically, if they're using them, they're not being honest. Um, homeowners can tell their own contractors not to use them. So to respond to town meeting member, um, Linda Pelka, it's complicated to say you can use it on October 1st, but not September 30th. It's much easier to just say, don't use them. Um, in short, by banning leaf blowers, we're protecting the workers. They don't have to choose uh, what to do. They don't have to find the electric leaf blowers. Their employers would provide them to them. Uh, quoting from a coalition for health and safe environment in Santa Cruz, landscape workers face unequal burdens, cleaning our yards and parks and often limited economic options. Requiring their employers to switch to cleaner equipment is a matter of basic equity, workplace safety, health, and environmental justice. It is long overdue. And I'll end with one note. I'm a homeowner with a yard in front of the back. We have gardeners. They don't use leaf blowers. 
We pay what it costs to clean the yard out of respect for the environment and for their health and for our neighbors' ears. Somehow our yard has survived um, and I'm sure yours can too. So please vote yes on this Warren article. Thank you, Ms. Michaels. Hello. Uh, a few years back, the moderator formed a committee. Who are you? Oh, sorry, I'm Faith Michaels. I'm a former town meeting member, but I'm a resident now. <laughs> okay, is that good, Sandy? That's, that's fine. Okay, uh, you can start timing me now. A few yep. years back, the moderator formed a committee and over 21 meetings later, research, actual testing, discussion, and compromise, we crafted bylaws that allowed gas leaf blowers for the heavy leaf cleanups at certain times of the year. We're allowed to use only 67 decibel machines and we must switch over to electric for the summer. Is it perfect? No, but it's a work in progress. We currently have some of the strictest bylaws regarding this machine and the Brookline BDPW is enforcing them and the town is quieter. The machines have been redesigned to pass strict EPA regulations. Leaf blowers are low hanging fruit in terms of CO2 emissions. They emit only 0.038 of all CO2 emissions in the US. Banning them may make you feel like you're doing something important, but what you're really doing is hurting small businesses like ours and the mainly immigrant population who does this work. The petitioner's statement that um, the 30 minutes the leaf blower produces more CO2 is a mid than a mid-sized truck driving 500 miles. Really? Come on, think about it. That is not true. That research was also done back in 2011. And much like the um, petitioners warrant research, it's out of date or incorrect. If electric machines worked well, I would be the first to completely switch over. First of all, the batteries don't hold the charge um, and you know they're expensive, but look, I am willing to bear the cost. I recently bought three electric backpack blowers that claim to have longer battery life. And guess what? They actually do. The problem is, is the battery is extremely heavy to carry on the back because it's huge. The other design issue is that the blower is handheld and too heavy to hold for long work hours. I will no longer be able to do cleanups and either close my business two months early or change it and reduce staff. We cannot expect people to rake nine hours a day or work with machinery that will cause injury. I'm one of the few women owned businesses who work in the Brookline parks. We clean up Olmsted Park and it takes three days with 10 people. I actually don't make any profit on that job and I do it as a point of pride for being a Brookliner. And I can't do one this minute. work without a gas blower. How will the um, immigrant population be hurt? Taking away this tool will make a, a, a difficult job impossible. And um, I also wanna say that our clients are made up of elderly disabled residents, uh, working families, and they depend on us to keep our properties clean and safe. We're mom and pop businesses. We've built our companies from the ground up. My success has enabled me to give back to my employees and the town, the cleanup at the park, the new rotary installation, the seasonal container work at Amory are all things I can do because we're successful. One last point, why should wealthy homeowners with over one acre land, country clubs, schools, institutions, and even the town be exempt from this proposed ban? This smacks of discriminatory action towards our small business and the folks who work with us. The point is that if electric blowers really work, the town and others with more than an acre would not have been given a pass. Please vote no action on warrant article 27. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson, Anita Johnson. Uh, Anita Johnson, Precinct 8. Uh, this owner of the local landscaping company that just spoke took the position before uh, the advisory committee that electric leaf, electric leaf blowers were inferior because they leave behind pieces of vegetative material on the grass while gas leaf blowers scrub all other vegetative materials off of the grass. If electric leaf blowers leave some vegetative material, such as leaves, twigs, pieces of flower petals, and grass clippings on the grass, that is a good thing environmentally, and that is not a bad thing. As immaculate, super cleaned lawns are not a healthy lawn environmentally. 
Vegetative material left on the lawn helps maintain carbon and nitrogen in the soil, nutrients necessary for continued soil fertility. This is the subject of an academic paper in the journal Environmental Pollution by Pamela Templer, a Brookline resident who is professor of biology at Boston University. Vegetative material left on the lawn provides harbor for insect growths that become food for our birds and our bees. You may have noticed, as I have, that super cleared off lawns have few or no birds on them. The birds are attracted to other natural areas. Electrical leaf blowers can do the job and gas blowers are to the least inessential for lawn maintenance. Thank you. Thank you, Julian Fisher. F-I-S-H-E-R. Okay, uh, Mark Gerber, town meeting member. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Um, Mark Gerber, Precinct 13, speaking in opposition to Article 27. Uh, as people have pointed out, leaf blower usage and regulation has been studied extensively by the town previously, and a balanced law of partial gas-powered leaf blower ban has been in place for several years now. The health department has found no compelling health threat from their use, and a total ban on gas-powered leaf blowers was unnecessary. The overall air quality in Brookline is rated good by the Mass DEP. That's the highest rating on the EPA air quality scale and has been improving for the last 15 years. Emissions from leaf blowers are not considered a compelling problem requiring further regulation. Calls to police are a waste of our precious resources and the additional expense of a dedicated DPW employee to respond to leaf blower calls is another waste of our precious resources that could clearly be spent on better things by the town. While gas powered leaf blower bans may be a trendy topic and ban proponents sincerely believe that they are making significant environmental impact, the battery powered replacements contribute in their own way to environmental degradation. The primary elements in lithium ion batteries used in leaf blowers Cobalt and lithium are either mined by children in the Congo or slave labor in China. And in both geographies, there are no environmental controls in place. And finally, as noted, battery disposal, which happens frequently because the battery lifespans are only one to two years, as noted by the DPW and other, others who reported at the public hearings, creates its own set of environmental problems. Remember, there are always trade-offs in terms of technologies and there are no absolutes. Um, Faith did a great job of highlighting the email that she sent out to the town meeting members earlier today. And I just want to reiterate that the gas powered leaf blowers have been redesigned to pass strict EPA regulations. Total emissions of gas powered leaf blowers contribute a minuscule 0.038% of all CO2 emissions in the United States. Electric leaf blowers are significantly heavier and more expensive than similarly powered gas blowers. The additional expense will cause landscapers to stop taking business in the town and force homeowners, particularly the elderly who cannot perform this work themselves to absorb the resulting price increases. And finally, the electric blowers are simply not powerful enough to handle the wet leaf cleanup in the fall. The landscapers note rightly that if battery powered leaf blowers were comparable, they would use them, but they're not. When the technology reaches that stage, then the transition will occur without having to resort to a bludgeoning tool of government fiat and the resulting resentment of town government and its appointed enforcers. From a personal standpoint, I think the article to ban the gas powered leaf blowers takes the town in a bad direction. It's abusive to the homeowners as well as workers. We're targeting private homeowners, taxpayers, our neighbors with significant financial punishment for using or hiring landscapers who use legal products regulated by the EPA designed to perform necessary chores like cleaning up a massive fall leaf drop. The likelihood of increasing the number of violations with a total gas ban is, is significant. Both Palo Alto and Santa Monica, California put gas bans into effect in the early 2000s and still today report hundreds of violations annually. Palo Alto recently suspended enforcing its ban and has yet to employ any ban enforcers. The landscapers will earn their living by using this equipment on a daily basis and who provide these property owners an affordable service have spoken out and well, and I am for one in agreement with them. Please vote no action on Article 27. Thank you. I have a motion for the question. Um, I don't think further debate is going to persuade anybody. I think we've heard a full discussion of each side. And I'll <coughs> allow that motion, Mr. Sandman's motion. 
and it has been seconded. <coughs> Excuse me. I have Ms. Jonas signed up in favor. I have the following people signed up against. Mr. Daves, town meeting member, and the following people who are all owners of small landscape businesses. Mr. Gold, Stephen Gold, George Vasios, Monique Allen, Florina Marcal. I have Mr. Wang in the queue with a comment and a question. Mr. Gray with a comment. Mr. Penzel with a comment. Ms. Goldsmith with a question. And Mr. Koltoff with a question. Uh, this is a motion for the question, motion to terminate debate. If it passes, we will uh, uh, move to the main motion. If it's defeated, we will uh, hear from more speakers. Motion, uh, motion for the question and this voting period has commenced. Now the count, please. Motion carries by a two thirds vote, 182 in favor, 46 opposed and nine abstentions. On the main motion, the amendment of the bylaw to ban gas powered leaf blowers on pages 27-4 over to 27-9. This is article 27 main motion if you vote if the motion carries the leaf blower bylaw will be amended as you've heard if it fails we'll retain the bylaw in its present form main motion article 27 voting period has commenced Now the count. Motion is defeated by a vote of 95 in favor, 126 opposed, and 18 abstentions. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, 10 o'clock. We have four articles to go. Article 30 is a uh, <clears throat> uh, has a number of people who will speak in favor of the main motion and uh, only one opponent. Uh, article th Articles 31, 32, and 35 are, uh, well, 35 has uh, got people on both sides and so does uh, 31, certainly. Uh, <clears throat> so, I would like to get through Article 30 this evening. As I say, we have no, nothing but uh, affirmative speakers with one exception. Uh, and then uh, deal with the remaining three articles tomorrow evening. But uh, that, of course, is up to town meeting, not me. So Article 30, the motion is on the Crimson Supplement number one, pages one to two. And uh, here again, we have to 
amend the motion by adding the following words at the beginning of the motion at the begin in the middle of page one of uh, supplement number one voted that the town adopt the following resolution colon etc in the words of the motion moved by mr sandman seconded by Ms. Wright. mr wachter you have six minutes Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I hope not to take all of them. Um, my name is Jeff Walker, and I'm a Brookline resident at 411 Washington Street. In uh, you, there's something something wrong with your transmission. I uh, you may have the TV on. I don't know. Um, no. Um, well, try it anyway. You. All right. Um, can you hear me better now? Yes. It's uh, it's a problem with your microphone, I think. Um, I mean, I, it, all right. I'm I'm gonna um switch. I'm gonna go give the speech from my wife's computer. Is that all right? Yeah, but we can't wait for. Uh, 30, I'll, I'll have to it, hear. It'll be thirty seconds at most. Okay. Well, <laughs> Mr. Wachter, um, I'm afraid we can't wait around for you because uh, we. Yep, Mr. Sandman, if you can email him and uh, let him know that he's going to have to. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Moderator, Mike Sandman speaking for the select board in support of Article 30 as uh, amended. The concept of building affordable housing above the town owned parking lot between Kent Street and Station Street was first proposed by a resident several years ago. I want to say about 10, but several anyway. The parking lot is valuable for people who work in the village's stores and restaurants. And a promise was made to the community that the 37 parking spaces in the lot would be preserved on the assumption that the spaces would be left at ground level with a building above it. The promise was also made to preserve pedestrian access across the lot so that people could walk through from the MBTA stop to Kent Street, and there were promises to abutters about setbacks. The town has been working to fulfill that vision with To Life, a highly regarded nonprofit developer. When they got to work on designing the building, To Life realized that to preserve on-site parking, pedestrian access, and setbacks, the parking area would have to be smaller and some of the parking would have to go underground. Underground parking is very expensive to build on the order of $100,000 per space. The unanticipated cost of preserving perhaps as many as 37 spaces combined with increased overall construction costs made the product appear to be financially infeasible. Rather than scrap the plan, there was an effort made to solve the cost problem and still preserve the availability of 37 spaces, even if not all the spaces were uh, on site. And in fact, you will have an email from town meeting member Liz Linder uh, explaining that, uh, that compromise. The amended article calls on the project to move forward on the condition that the transportation board identifies and secures replacement for the number of spaces that cannot be retained on site. At this stage, it's not possible to identify exactly how many offsite spaces are needed or where they'll be. But people working in businesses can currently buy permits to park on streets. Uh, the number of available street spaces is limited so as to preserve on-street parking for residents as well as for those employer, employee permit holders. But it appears possible to identify additional spaces for employee parking permits. With, they'll be within walking distance of the commercial area. The goal is to have transportation staff work with all the stakeholders to identify potential parking spaces and then go through a public review by the transportation board. By a vote of four to zero with one abstention, the select board recommends favorable action on the amended resolution 
as distributed in supplement one and modified, I believe, by um, the addition that uh, Mr. Gasby uh, read off, uh, supplement one to the combined reports. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wachter. Uh, thank you, Assistant Moderator. Um, hopefully, uh, you guys can hear me all better now. Thank you. Yes, you're, you're fine now. Awesome. Um, my name is Jeff Wachter. I'm a Brooklyn resident at 411 Washington Street. In November of 2016, town meeting overwhelmingly supported Article 34, which called for the development of a proposal for suitable air rights development of age-restricted, affordable, mixed-income housing over the existing town-owned parking lot in Brookline Village between Kent and Station Streets. This resolution led to the formation of the Kent Station Affordable Senior Housing Committee, whose mission was to develop that project. The proponents advocated for senior housing to be built at this prime location for multiple reasons that remain true today. The senior population has been growing in Brookline as the baby boomer demographic uh, reaches retirement age. They noted that a majority of, se of senior renters over 60% at the time were rated as housing cost burden because they pay more than 30% of their income for housing. That Brookline had committed to joining the World Health Organization's age-friendly city initiative, the first municipality in New England to join. And that the 2016 public engagement process that led to the housing production plan identified town-owned parking lots as potential sites to build more homes. However, the project as negotiated by the Kent Station Affordable Senior Housing Committee has stalled. The negotiating committee's report released just a couple months ago uh, recommended no action by the town on the disposition of the Kent Station Street parking lot to Two Life. While multiple reasons were outlined, one of the most significant impediments is the cost of maintaining the on-site parking spaces. To build the parking on site would require $5.7 million of town subsidies for a total subsidy of more than $12 million. The resolution under Warren Article 30 was filed with the expectation that the on-site parking requirement stood as a nearly insurmountable impediment to getting to this project, and that and the 50 to 60 homes for low-income seniors it would create built. The co-petitioners and I sought to provide increased flexibility to the negotiating committee to allow fewer parking spaces on site if it would result in an economically feasible project. As is so often the case, after a series of public hearings with various committees, the petitioners have agreed that the compromise resolution as proposed by the select board and outlined by Mr. Salmon is the most viable path toward building homes for low-income seniors in the heart of Brookline Village. The compromise resolution maintains the current number of parking spaces for Brookline Village merchant, overnight resident, and zip car usage, some, some remaining on site and some off site but nearby. It provides flexibility to the transportation department and transportation board to identify appropriate locations for permit parkers and will open a path to a new RFP with less expensive and onerous parking requirements. If town meeting passes this resolution, the following steps will be taken, hopefully culminating in new senior housing. The transportation department and the transportation board would identify alternative locations for merchant parking permit spaces with public hearings held by both the transportation board and the economic development advisory board. Upon approval of the new parking plan, a new RFP would be written and issued by the select board. The RFP would require the number of public parking spaces necessary to maintain the scale of the current merchant parking program. The committee will go through the process of selecting a builder and will work together to create a project that maximizes the amount of affordable senior housing at this site. Once a suitable project is created, funding identified, and the project ready to move forward, town meeting will then need to approve the land disposition by a two thirds vote, whether that's through sale or lease. While this process is not necessarily an easy path toward badly needed senior housing, we believe it to be the most viable route to a project supported by a wide array of stakeholders. Therefore, I urge, I urge you all to vote favorable action on the motion offered under Warren Article 34 by the Select Board. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jonas. I'm sorry, uh, I'm gonna call on uh, Henry Winkleman, who's our opposition speaker. You have five minutes. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Uh, good evening. Oh, pardon me. Good evening, uh, town meeting members. My name is Henry Wickman. I've lived in Brookline since 2004 and now live in Precinct 13 with my wife, who is the lead petitioner for Warren Article 34 at the 2016 Fall Town Meeting resolution to develop a proposal for suitable air rights development of affordable senior housing above the Kent Station Street parking lot. Thank you for this opportunity to share why I oppose Warren Article 30 and show multiple reasons why a vote against Warren Article 30 is not a vote against the idea of affordable housing in Brookline. Next slide, please. 
The idea of town, the town possibly using its air rights above the public parking lots to locate much needed affordable senior housing was first presented to and grew out of the Livable Communities Advocacy Committee at the Senior Center in November of 2013. Next slide, please. Then it was presented to the HAB in May of 2014. After being advised to wait for five town meetings, I finally decided to act. After a grueling debate at town meeting in 2016, the study of this air rights concept was approved. Next slide, please. I oppose Warren Article 30 because it goes against the two key aspects of Warren Article 34 that were never explored. It has discarded the words air rights completely. It altered the specific requirements for maintaining public parking. Next slide, please. While I fully support the, uh, the creation of a more affordable housing, I am forced to oppose Warren Article 30 because it blatantly mislabels and misrepresents Article 34. Arab rights development is the fundamental tenet of Warren Article 34, and it is clearly stated as such in both the mission and on its charge. charge. Yet Warren Article 30 has omitted air rights development when citing Warren Article 34, which is a misrepresentation. It does not include air rights development at all. Then Warren Article 30 must not reference Warren Article 34, and it must be a, a fine different approach. They must find a different approach. Uh, please note on this uh, slide and charge above, the charge clearly states air right development it is to be used. The charge does not state all the public parking. It says the public parking. Oh, and by the way, I don't believe Warren Article, uh, the number two was ever performed. Um, anyway, next slide, please. At the uh, Kent Station Street Affordable Senior Housing Committee uh, first meeting in February of 2017, I made a PowerPoint presentation that explained the concept of air rights development and showed multiple examples of air rights development across the country. No meeting minutes were posted for this meeting. My PowerPoint show on the examples of air rights development has been removed from the committee's webpage. In addition, meeting minutes were not per, uh, posted for the following meetings either when I suggested people uh, to be interviewed and in, uh, the uh, issues discussed related to air rights development. I was simply told privately, quote, thank you for what you did, Henry, but we will take it from here, end quote. FYI, if you create a single FD, uh, PDF of all agendas and meeting minutes, air rights will not be found anywhere. Next slide, please. At an AC meeting before town meeting, uh, the Warren Article 30 representative responded to the question, why wasn't air rights development included in the RFP with the statement that it was included in the request for information, but there was no interest from the respondents? This is not true. Quote, air rights, end quote, was not mentioned in the RFI at all, even though this was their charge. Next slide, please. Since many of the town meeting members uh, were not at the November 2016 town meeting, please allow me a moment uh, to quickly summarize what was presented at the, the November 2016 town meeting. Next slide. Frank Carroll, rest in peace, my lead supporter and advisor of this matter, said we needed to find a site where affordable housing uh, was possible, but that there are few unbuilt sites and none that were inexpensive. My initial idea was just to use the parking lots to locate the affordable housing. Next slide, please. However, Frank told me that he didn't think this idea would ever pass. He told me about the Marriott Hotel in Coolidge Corner in 1999, formerly known as the Whipster Street plot. Anyway, while I was a student at Boston University, I was in the BAMA program and took two classes in BU School of Law. That's how One I minute. about air rights development. I suggest that we use air rights development above the parking lots to locate affordable senior housing and unused airspace above uh, also sim sim simultaneously Per, per, I'm sorry, I've gotten nervous, Mr. Moderator. May we request another minute? Simultaneously preserving the town's public parking. Frank liked the idea, but told me he needed proof of the town meeting before it would act, town meeting would act. So I started my research. Next slide, please. Basically, air rates development. Uh, basically, uh, air, the key requirements of air rights development are that, uh, that at least two separate and completely unrelated uses, mass turnpike above or below, and a hotel and a grocery store above, and there are two separate and unrelated owners. Next slide, please. Here are some quick, quick diagrams I created to try and explain the concept of air rights development and how it relates to the situation in Brookline. We've got the town of Brookline's Public parking lot, next slide, please. 
Then you have the opportunity in the airspace above. Next slide, please. And that's where you can put the affordable senior housing. Next slide, please. I did extensive research for many examples of air rights development. Uh, then I hit the gold mine. I located four examples of affordable senior housing that were de developed above active LA County parking lots. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Sherm Notes, California, next slide, please. I don't have time to go over all these. This this project of affordable senior housing in Santa Monica. Next slide, next slide, please. The final project was in Beverly Hills. Fortunately, while my attempts to contact Mr. Yaroslavsky were unsuccessful, the examples of his air rights development helped Warren Article 34 get approved. Next slide, please. Well, now you've been seven minutes, sir, and, and uh, you signed up for five. Uh, you know what, Mr. Moderator? I'm going to ask you, ask you please to conclude. Uh, the, the final updates. Uh, uh, basically, uh, as I was working with uh, my, on my capstone at Georgetown University, I performed extensive research into air rights development. The unofficial Bible of air rights development is a paper written by, in 1964 by Leonard Gord Schmidt. To my surprise, Goldschmidt actually cited a project that we can look at very quickly in Cambridge. Next slide, uh, please. Mr. Winkleman, uh, this is not, uh, please conclude your presentation. I will, uh, uh, 15 seconds. Right now. It, basically, right, next slide, please. Seconds. Next slide, please. This is, uh, this is uh, Harvard Square. You're zooming in on Harvard Square and to your left, right above uh, uh, Charles Square is a project. Go to the next slide, please. This is a perfect no, example. No, sir. Slide. I, I'm sorry. You're going to have to conclude. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you for your time. Ms. Jonas. Ms. Jonas. Hi. Yep. Here I am. <laughs> uh, Alisa Jonas, town meeting member, Precinct 16, speaking on behalf of the advisory committee recommending favorable action on amended Warren Article 30. The advisory committee received much public input on this article, including a petition signed by 73 residents and merchants, 13 emails, and 14 public comments at a well-attended hearing. All but one of the comments were in strong opposition to the original article because of the loss of the only public parking lot for all-day parking in Brookline Village. Business owners noted that hiring sufficient numbers of employees has been challenging, and being unable to provide parking will make it even harder. Many employees live in communities that are far from Brookline, and public transportation options are simply not adequate to make it worthwhile to make the long commute on a daily basis. Contractors and other persons who support the functioning of businesses must also have places to park for more than two to three hours. The business owners noted that Brookline Village is known for its vibrant commercial area and the town as a whole benefits from the higher tax rates charged to businesses, but with limited parking, customers will go elsewhere. Residents also commented about parking difficulties and that they have gotten worse over time with the increases in residential units and offices. An elderly resident who wants to age in place in Brookline Village noted that the increasingly challenging parking situation, ironically, might force her to move from the village since she often has no place to park to unload her groceries and that her uh, that she has to look further and further to park her car um, further from home. The amended version of Warren Article 30 arose as a way to balance the needs of Brookline Village businesses and residents for parking with the town's commitment to add units of affordable senior housing. And without the requirement that all parking be located on site, it now becomes possible to consider at least a modified version of the original plan of using air rights for the development. The amended article also requires public hearings and review by EDAB and the Transportation Board. A variety of concerns were nonetheless raised by advisory committee members. One concern was that to date, no good alternatives have been identified for replacement parking. The town has already inquired about parking possibilities at the new garage at one Brookline place and was told that it was not available. On-street permitted parking, which is provided to teachers, is already at 40% use usage, which in general is the maximum percent of on-street spaces assigned to permitted parking. Making use of an even higher percent would decrease available parking for residents, customers, and visitors. 
Another concern was that given the site's location by the MBTA, it could be more valuable to the town if sold or leased for commercial use, which would bring in much needed tax dollars. Finally, it was noted that the site was selected without an overall town planning process that includes analyses of parking needs and the most appropriate locations for additional housing. The advisory committee voted twice on the amended article. The first time the vote was essentially tied. A second vote was held following the petitioner's decision to support the amended article and the select board vote in favor. This time, the advisory committee voted to recommend favorable action largely because the business community representatives informed the advisory committee that it was willing to give its support since the compromise guarantees replacement of the all day parking spots, though they remain concerned about the likely net loss of overall public parking. Partly for the same reason, as well as for other concerns discussed earlier, the advisory committee was still somewhat split in its position with three members voting in opposition and eight members abstaining. Still, with 11 members voting to support the amended resolution, the advisory committee recommends favorable action on warrant article 30 as amended. Thank you, Mr. Blood, four minutes. <laughs> Mr. Blood, are you with us? You may have to unmute yourself, Mr. Blood. Can you hear me now? There you go. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Assistant Moderator. Um, I'm, I'm Roger Blood. I serve on the, <clears throat> the um, Housing Advisory Board and um, along with uh, uh, Select Board Chair Heather Hamilton have served on all four of the required um, uh, uh, committees on behalf of the town since the original town meeting uh, article resolution uh, in 2016. <clears throat> Let me begin just uh, by speaking to uh, a similar concern that was expressed by several different individuals uh, during recent public meetings on Warnock Article 30. Essentially, um, the, the same question was raised. Uh, why are we being asked uh, as, as uh, or why will town meeting members be asked uh, to to choose between our support for affordable housing and our support for Brookline Village businesses who uh, need parking for their employees. Arguably, it's true that the original Warren Article 30 was asking town meeting members to make such a Hobson's choice, but, but Warren Article 30 in the form that's before you now has been amended, uh, as you've heard um, from prior speakers, so as not to ask you to make such a choice. Your vote for favorable action on Warren Article 30 as amended will enable the town to continue its pursuit of desperately needed uh, senior affordable housing over the Kent Street parking lot while also remaining true to town meeting stated intent in the original 2016 resolution that parking for our local businesses not be sacrificed. We believe that the reason why both the select board and the advisory committee have now voted strong support for the amended Warren Article 30 is that it, a range of advocates and stakeholders have been heard and that their needs are being addressed. Those who helped to amend the original article included our local business people, EDAB members, uh, senior housing advocates, uh, AC subcommittee members, and uh, uh, not least our professional staff. Your approval now would allow further pursuit of a feasible and favorable outcome with some important added caveats along the way, which you've already heard about. Our prior uh, 2019 issuance of an RFP produced two outstanding proposals from highly qualified nonprofit um, senior housing sponsors, um, of which we made the difficult choice of uh, choosing uh, to life communities. Rapidly rising costs, however, drove the required town subsidy to an excessive 12 million plus and rising amount, uh, largely due to the parking component. Warren Article 30 will authorize an amended RFP to be issued uh, that will allow some greater parking flexibility, a reduced project cost, and a more reasonable town subsidy. 
One minute. Uh, any revised plan will, will still entail a transfer by the town of property related rights, including potentially air rights. Um, and I will be prepared to answer questions about that if they arise um, following the, the presentations. Air rights, which means that the town meeting will retain final approval uh, requiring a two thirds vote. In concluding, I do need to note that um, our uh, several days ago, uh, the governor proposed using state ARPA funding towards all projects that had previously applied for mass works grants, which included Kent Strait Station, uh, including our uh, 4.5 million request for the Kent Station Street project. This line item legislation will now begin to go through the state legislative process. However, even if all of this funding were actually awarded to, to this project, in addition to available housing trust funds and potentially CPA funding, we would still be several million dollars short with the current project proposal uh, from being able to move forward. The governor's initial proposal has no practical effect on the amended Warren Article 30 resolution before you. Warren Article 30 provides the time and the, feasib the flexibility to potentially significantly lower project costs and help to move this project forward. So yeah, please um, conclude. we request that please you please conclude, vote sir. favorable action on Warren Article 30. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Saner, four minutes. And then we'll hear from Susan Healy, who's a business owner. And then um, if someone cares to move the question, I'll allow that. Mr. Saner. Uh, good evening, Paul Saner, Precinct 13, co-chair of the Economic Development Advisory Board, uh, EDAB, originally voted in favor of um, the 2016 resolution uh, since it balanced housing and commercial interests. Uh, EDAB was interested in the air rights uh, proof of concept uh, and parenthetically EDAB a year ago voted against uh, the Babcock Street resolution for a similar study since A, the concept still hasn't yet been proven, and B, that particular resolution did not balance housing and commercial interests. As you've already heard, Article 30 as filed also failed to uh, balance uh, commercial interests. Uh, and um, uh, EDAB heard from a number of um, small business owners, uh, women-owned businesses in Brookline Village about the critical importance of uh, parking for uh, their staff. And I hope you hear directly uh, from some of them uh, this evening. Uh, EDAB uh, heard this article first and uh, uh, voted it down um, for two reasons. One, uh, we had incomplete information. Uh, the following week, a report came out from the study committee um, that talked about some last breaking um, legal issues that um, resulted in significant cost premium. Um, and um, uh, the um, other uh, reason is um, that uh, it, uh, there was no compromise on the table. I want to applaud the advisory committee ad hoc committee who worked very long and hard on formulating a compromise, which uh, my EDAB co-chair and I then discussed uh, in several Zoom meetings with um, the Brookline Village Merchants, as well as uh, the president of the chamber. And um, that um, led to um, a, the compromise amendment um, that the uh, select board uh, voted. Um, air rights development, um, I think um, if I were Mr. Winkleman, I would vote uh, in favor of this compromise because it keeps the door open on the potential for uh, an air rights uh, development. Uh, EDAB is going to have a public hearing pursuant to this compromise if you vote it. And I personally am going to be watching closely for as much parking to be at grade to um, minimize um, what might need to be approved by the transportation board uh, elsewhere in Brookline Village. Uh, so in summary, I urge uh, favorable action on the compromise motion. And as Mr. Blood indicated, uh, this, um, if there is a deal, will come back to town meeting with at a minimum 
a two thirds vote relative to transfer of property rights. Now is not the time to get into whether it should be a long-term sale or a lease or an outright sale. Again, thank you for your, um, listening to me and please vote in favor of the compromise which the Brook Brookline Village uh, community supports. Ms. Healy. Thank you, Assistant Moderator and Town Meeting members for allowing me to speak this evening. My name is Susan Healy. I am not a resident. However, I have been part of the Brookline Village business community for 22 years as the owner of HC Studio on Station Street. I am also speaking tonight about Warren Article 30. And a little history, uh, Warren Article 30 actually originated from Warren Article 34 that was passed in 2016, six long years ago, a development concept that would lease the air rights above the town owned Kent Station Street lot to build senior affordable housing while maintaining the existing parking. And this was a brilliant idea then, and I believe a brilliant idea today. It surprises me that this concept is not being pursued and I wonder why. Warren Article 34 was supported by the business community at large. Now, six years later, Warren Article 30 has been introduced replacing Warren Article 34. This new article removed the concept of air rights and also removed the guarantee of maintaining the existing parking. How can this happen? This caused a big upset in the Brookline Village business community as many of our business owners have employees that cannot afford to live in Brookline or the surrounding areas and travel from far distances in order to work, such as the case with my business. I have employees that travel from Providence, Harvard, Hanover, Situate, Milton, Rosendale, Fitchburg, Walpole, and Worcester, and they all rely heavily on being able to park here. Many evenings we work until 930, and the Kent Station Street lot is safe, centrally located, and is well lit. Um, I also am very appreciative to the members of the subcommittee, advisory committee, and select board. Through many lengthy discussions over the past several weeks, it's become clear that building affordable senior housing and merchant parking are equally important. The final outcome from these tireless evenings is a revised Warren Article 30, which is the one you'll be voting on tonight. As a business owner, I am pleased that the revised version is being presented to you this evening. Although it is not perfect and I still have many concerns, it does provide a compromise. Now, I am not happy about the thought of losing even one parking spot, metered or permitted, but I trust that after a thorough study has been conducted, we will have important information that will be our compass as how to move forward with development. How this article is handled will set the precedent for all parking lots in Brookline. It is critical that development is executed with thoughtful, responsible planning. So with your yes vote on Warren Article 30, we will finally get a study to identify the true parking needs of the Brookline Village community, not only for today, but for our future. We cannot continue to bring more people in while taking away parking for those who visit, work and live here. I am committed and will be very involved during this entire process to ensure that the town conducts a thorough parking study. And when a new RFP is submitted, it will be one that is positive for the entire Brookline Village community to thrive and grow into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sandman moves and Mr. Mabrook seconds motion for the question. I have uh, the following people signed up to speak in favor of this mo motion. Ms. Ms. Zimmerman, Mr. Van Skoyak, Mr. Pollock, uh, Mr. Gladstone, David Gladstone, who will uh, provide a joint statement of the Brookline Village Business Association and the Chamber of Commerce. He's the ch head of the chamber. Uh, Carol Carroll and Ms. Linder. I have uh, Mr. Richmond, Mr. Hebert uh, with questions, Mr. Klein with a statement in favor. And uh, we have before us the motion for the question. If, you, if the motion uh, is successful, then uh, debate will be terminated and we will proceed to a vote on the motion, main motion. 
uh, if it fails to get a two thirds vote, we will uh, continue to hear from others. Ready for a moment, a motion for the question. The voting period has started. This is on the motion to terminate debate under Article 30. <clears throat> Have the vote. 181 yes. Motion no. 11 abstentions. Motion carries by a two thirds vote. 181 in favor, 40 opposed, and 11 abstentions. On the main motion on supplement number one, a vote in favor is a vote to adopt this resolution. The vote opposed is a vote to not adopt it. We're ready for main motion, Article 30. Voting period has started. Now the vote. 182 yes, 31 no, 18 abstentions. Motion carries by a vote of 182 in favor, 31 opposed, and 18 abstentions. We have remaining articles 31, 32, and 35. My estimate is that it'll take at least an hour to get through these three articles. And um, so I will take a motion to adjourn. Is that motion been made? Yeah. All right, it has been seconded. All right, this is a motion to adjourn, not a recorded vote. Motion to adjourn until 7 p.m. tomorrow evening. Vote. Motion to adjourn carries by a vote of 193 in favor, 36 opposed, and five abstentions. Town meeting is adjourned until 7 p.m. tomorrow. <clears throat>